Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. If you were not able to join us for this morning's session, we would like to inform you about what today is about. The BLM and the BIA are hosting these virtual open houses to provide an opportunity for the public to ask us questions regarding the recently published Farfington Mancus Resource Management Plan Amendment and an associated environmental impact statement. This document was released to the public in February of this year. It was initially uh, put out for the public for a 90-day public comment review, but since has been given an additional 120-day extension. So currently the public comment review period will end on September 25th. This morning's session, we were asked some questions by members of the audience that are still with us this afternoon pertaining to the plan of uh, resource impacts and some concerns that they have with how some of those impacts might be mitigated. We do have a few questions that are in the, our chat box that we received prior to going on our lunch break. So we're going to take care of those first. And then if any members of the audience have additional questions they'd like to ask us, they can use the raise hand feature if you're joining us by Zoom. Or if you're joining us by the telephone, you can press star nine and that'll notify us that you wish to provide a question. So our first question that we have uh, came from Ms. Rebecca Sobel. The question is, when will the recordings be posted in the project record? immediately after they are finished or some other time? And this is a follow-up question uh, to something that Rebecca had asked this morning. Uh, this morning's question asked if we, would, if we would be posting these meetings online after we completed them. And though these meetings are being recorded, we are not going to be posting them to our e-planning website. Each day we are hosting six hours of these meetings and that's a lot of material to be putting on a website and hoping that it stays intact so you're able to view. So these meetings, again, they are being recorded, but they will be kept in our project file. And everything that we hear from you this week, we will keep in mind as we move forward and develop our, our final EIS. You may be providing questions to us to help us clarify information in our document. Um, and hopefully we can clarify information to you so you can provide us some uh, substantive comments that can help formulate our analysis for that final decision. So Rebecca, uh, these recordings will be placed in our project file immediately. And that project file, that's an internal file that we keep. We have a lot of information that we keep in that internal file with this project and all of our other projects. Um, so do know that we are keeping this information. We will hold on to it um, as we move forward with developing that final environmental impact statement and record of decision. Okay, so our next question is again from Rebecca. And Rebecca is asking, why has the BLM and BIA not offered an alternative in the RMPA that provides for no more additional drilling? I'd like to send this question to the BLM project manager, Sarah Scott. And Sarah, could you introduce yourself um, before you start speaking in case we have new attendees that didn't get to hear you this morning? Sure. Thanks, Jill. Um, I'm Sarah Scott, the project manager for the BLM for this project. Um, yeah, and I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll, I'll address that question um, about uh, an alternative that would prohibit new drilling. Um, the the alternatives were developed through scoping input uh, from the public and ongoing outwork with our cooperating agencies, our internal resource specialists, stakeholders, et cetera, that helped us uh, develop this range of alternatives and establish the framework for the analysis. Uh, so from that scoping, the action alternatives um, that came of that were designed to address the four planning issues, which were the oil and gas uh, lands with wilderness characteristics, um, vegetation, and rights of ways, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, they also are designed to fulfill the purpose and need, which was identified. Um, that's on uh, section 1.2 in the document, if you want to look at that a little bit more. Uh, also designed to meet the BLM's multiple use mandates outlined in FLTMA, the Federal uh, Land and Policy Management Act, which is 
BLM's guiding uh, uh, regulation, and um, as also to achieve the BIA's mission uh, to enhance quality of life, promote economic opportunity, and protect and improve trust resources. Um, and with that, I'm going to offer over to Robert if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, question, Rebecca. <clears throat> Just to answer partly, and now I'm going to defer this to Superintendent However, um, really quickly, the from the NEPA side, it's really as part of the alternatives, the development of the alternative is really developed from the public scoping. Based on the public scoping, that's just how we develop the four alternatives that the BIA has. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to superintendent to answer the rest of the question. I just talk. Superintendent. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Again, thank you for that question. The BIA has a trust and fiduciary responsibility to a lot of and we work closely with them on, on land use decisions, uh, which could be leasing, uh, which could be rights of ways uh, for pipeline and other um, economic type of benefits. Uh, so we work closely with them on those types of uh, opportunities. And so part of our mission is really to support um, Native American, especially those that have individual uh, allotments out there. And as you know, in, in this area, uh, there are <clears throat> allotments within the planning area. And we also know that many of them are benefiting from the development that's going on right now. Um, I hear stories about <clears throat> grandmothers having some money for their grandkids for school supplies and things like that because of the benefits they're getting from uh, leasing from the oil and gas development. I just wanted to add that comment. Thank you. Great. Thank you, BLM and BIA, for responding to that question. Uh, just so you know, we are continuing to take your questions. If you would like to provide a question to us, you can use the raise hand feature on your Zoom platform, or if you're joining us by telephone, please press star nine, and that'll let us know that you would like to provide your question. We do have a caller that has their hand raised. Mario, same as this morning, I'm gonna open up your microphone. Let's do a quick sound check, make sure we can hear you, and then you can provide us your question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mario. Okay. Uh, let's see. Number one, Rick Field said scoping meetings. There's years and years of scoping meetings. We need to point out that some of the scoping meetings, BLM themselves walked out of those scoping meetings. How many directors or field managers was that ago? We don't know. Uh, so continuity over the whole time and developing relationship as a trustee with with the people involved, deeply involved with this RMP, uh, real shaky and uh, not really, can't really trust that, you know, that the BLM is really saying this with any, with the straight face, that they're really talking straight. All right, now let's see how many meetings are at most. And they say we're, we're operating off of the 2003 RMP that was the consultation there was only done with Window Rock as a Dear Tribal Leader letter, not consultation. So this whole process has never been involved local communities in, in any real sense. So that's just listening to the conversations while I was trying to help out a community earlier. And so, um, and then listening to uh, Director Lester, you know, super, not Director, Superintendent Lester Sosis. Uh, just by his very definition of environmental justice, he is saying, and it's our and it's our our right to say this whole process is discriminatory to the poor people. Whatever, however he defined environmental justice by his very fact, um, you see people would have to gather in their cars in the heat 
wasting their gas to sit over a little tiny mic, sit over cell phone to maybe talk to you while you're sitting in air conditioned places in far flung metropolitan areas, way away from where the people are being adversely affected from an environmental justice perspective. So a lot of that stuff is just really disingenuous. I think I say, all right. And then next I was really, uh, disappointed with um, no one answered my question i just heard again superintendent talk about oh grandma's get money when when are they getting money now the fiduciary responsibility trustee because mar mar marathon petroleum a midstream infrastructure company has shut down and we were seeing that we a lot t's were paying for the transportation costs for some of this stuff in the stipulations who negotiated that and was that was that just and was that the right of a trustee to do so? Oh, no, don't just throw it on people. Oh, yeah, grandma's getting money. Are they getting money now? Catch up, listen to what we said. And they said, Oh, Daniel, so sorry, prior to process, you didn't hear the substance and the intent of the letter that we read. Man, we have to talk at this level just to maybe get our point across to you. But yeah, Shona. It gets us very angry when we have to talk and maybe yell into a microphone. And these are only the, my responses to the questions earlier. Again, we need to be in person to be able to talk this out. Some of you are medicine people. You know this. Talk to your bosses and say, we shouldn't be doing this. We can't be doing this virtually. And it's up to you. I already called you out. I thought in person. And so this is a lot of yelling, so I'm going to calm down. And so my, my next questions are regarding cultural resources. Again, it goes all the way back down to Ms. Dixon's responses in that, oh, well, all of a sudden there's these great studies with Lano about water resources and air quality. I already said there's underlying assumptions in the models that are being adversely changed by federal actions right now. How is that being studied and disseminated to communities? Specifically, vis a -vis changes the Quado and Quado A and not only EPA, NEPA itself. Where's our NEPA expert? Someone from EPA, which, I don't know which region should be here. Again, failure on the trust responsibility. Bart Stevens, need to look at that and talk with your counterpart from Region 9, whatever. Probably just send a letter. Benny Naniki, the air section 800, adverse effects of cultural resources on the air and the water surrounding them. When you put in roads, it causes erosion. That's going to affect cultural resources. It was said by, I don't know who, maybe Mark Matthews said to a meeting, the last meeting, BLM does not recognize Navajo traditional cultural properties. Right in front of our faces, that's what was said. That can't stand. Who amongst Hodge and Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department, speak up on this, we ask you. That's very important, the spiritual health, the spiritual food of the people in this global pandemic. It's not just a checkbox to, to mark off and then say, oh, you poor Indians. Incredibly, incredibly important things that are happening. And so that's a lot to unpack and be here the next four hours and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You're gonna hear multiple iterations of my questions. Thank you, Mario. Uh, we will have our team begin responding. I think we'll go ahead and begin with BIA. Robert Begay, can you jump in and begin responding uh, to his question regarding cultural resources? And then if we also want to start discussing about allottees and royalties as well, I'm sure you've got people on your team that can assist in that discussion. Thank you, Jill. Sorry, Jill. 
Thank you, Jill. Um, those are, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Atencio, those are good questions. And a lot of the uh, <clears throat> questions, that, and I will defer some of those to our line officers. But um, the question concerning air and how that is a cultural resource, this has been discussed quite extensively through not only getting that information from public comment, but also from the original scoping meetings. We do understand, and, and it's been conveyed to us from the Navajo people, that there are four elements that are real basic to Navajo life. One of them is air, one of them is water, one of them is fire, and one is... Um, <clears throat> Now I just, excuse me on that. But in any case, the four basic elements, earth, that's the fourth basic element. And air is one of those things. And in addition to what you're asking, we did look at this. I do not recall where BLM um, have ever said that air is not a cultural resource. Um, again, we do understand this and um, we continue to analyze some of those issues um, to specifically answer your question to address your concerns on this please make an official um, comment on the draft eis and we will address those in, in as part of our um, public input um, record thank you and to answer the other question concerning the payment to Alakis, I will refer that to Maureen. Good afternoon. Thank you for that question. In regards to issues with royalties for two of the Alakis on Indian allotment, you are correct. Marathon oil um, or um, so what's happening on the back end of that is that any oil that Maureen yeah. Maureen we're having a really hard time hearing you can you get closer to your microphone please thank you I'm sorry about that is that better that's much better thanks Maureen so as I was saying that uh Mr. Antencio is correct that marathon is closing down its um, transportation processing plant in Gallup, New Mexico. As a result of that, there is, there, there is numerous companies that extract oil from the Eastern Agency within the San Juan Basin that did deliver their products through that company. Because it's shutting down, they're renegotiating that part of their market to another company. So when, when, um, so there, there isn't really going to be any interruption to the payment to the individual allottees. However, we have to also understand the market condition as a result of the pandemic globally. We're all being told to stay home, to take care of ourselves. And um, with that direction, there's hardly anyone moving or traveling. And so the products are not being used. The product, as a result, the products are being backed up. Inventory is getting full. And so the price is really diminishing. All of that is outside of agency control. That's all within the market globally. And um, there's, 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 there's so much that uh, we have authority over and that's basically as Superintendent had mentioned that we have a trust and a fiduciary responsibility. I understand with, with anything that we have people that are for, and then we have people that are against. 
And from a female BIA perspective, we have to try to balance that out. And that's the best we can do. Thank you. Great, thank you, BIA. Uh, Rick, would you like to respond to some of Mario's questions as well? Sure. <clears throat> So as far as the 2003 RMP consultation, consultation, we have improved how we consult with tribes. At the time that the 2003 RMP was uh, undertaken, um, there was an exchange with Navajo Nation um, and they either concurred or non-concurred. I haven't seen that particular file, but um, that is not how we do consultation now. And uh, but the 2003 RMP has been upheld um, multiple times in uh, litigation. And for the 2014 um, scoping round, we did three, me three meetings, three scoping meetings, and we received about 1800 comments. When BIA came on board as a, uh, a partner in this, we did 10 scoping meetings and received roughly 16,800 comments. Um, in, in addition to that, we have met numerous times with uh, various chapters. Uh, we've had numerous consultations with Navajo Nation um, president, and we've also done um, informational meetings with Navajo Nation staff. So we, we have, made a significant effort in our outreach on this project to make sure that we were getting the voice of Navajo Nation um, heard. Um, the meeting that was canceled in, during the 2016 uh, scoping that was over at Shiprock, uh, we went back and we did hold a very successful uh, scoping meeting there. <clears throat> you mentioned that you thought the EPA should be here. The EPA uh, reviews this document, they're a cooperating agency, but this is a BLM BIA uh, project. And so this was just to give information to the public and answer questions. And so that is strictly for the BLM and BIA to do since it is our document and our project, not the EPA's. This would not be appropriate for them to be here, but they are reviewing and we've had significant interchanges with the BLM. Um, the concerning comment about the BLM does not recognize traditional cultural properties. I was not there when that was said. We do recognize traditional cultural properties and sacred sites. And for those that may be unaware, there's a difference between the two. Um, but for both of them, we have to be told where they are. And for TCP, it has to be identifiable um, by a specific place and it has to be done within the confines of the National Historic Preservation Act. There have been many times where people have claimed something to be a, a TCP, but it has not been um, taken through the process of the National Historic Pro Preservation Act. And until it has been defined that way, we cannot legally call it a TCP. However, we usually do defer when we are consulting on projects and doing our on-site mitigation to try and avoid uh, traditional cultural places that we know about that have not been through the official process to designate such an area as either a traditional cultural place or a sacred site. Jill. Great, thanks Rick. Um, on that topic, I'd like to um, carry this conversation forward and go back with Robert Begay from the BIA and see if you had any additional input on that comment and how your agency recognizes Navajo Nation TCPs. And then once Robert's done, I'd like um, our archeologists to jump in if they have any additional information on top of what Rick provided for us. Robert? Uh, Jill, uh, Martensio, I just want to clarify a couple things on this. There are, the way BIA, um, identifies traditional cultural properties is really through the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department. They have a policy 
that they, they implement and we follow their lead as our 638 contractor. They take the lead as, um, as a self-determination um, contractor. But to, to sum it up, the National Historic Preservation Act does have some specific guidelines on how those are identified. In Navajo Nation, traditional cultural places, sacred sites are a little more broader. They're identified by at various different levels. There are traditional cultural properties or sacred sites that are recognized by the whole Navajo Nation people, the whole Navajo Nation. For example, all the four sacred mountains, that's recognizable by, by the whole Navajo Nation. Then you have traditional cultural properties or sacred sites that are identified within the community, like ceremonial places, Naja Tahiki, stuff like that, where ceremonies are conducted that the whole, the local community understands and where that's at. Then there's another layer of traditional cultural sacred places that is recognized and identified by families, extended families, where they make their, their um, offerings. There's um, not a just for their, their families uh, making offering places to specific springs, not that you know, binding places and stuff like that. Those are recognized at the family level or at the extended family level. Then you go down to the individual level where the individual, the one Navajo that identifies a sacred place that's sacred and a traditional cultural property to them. This is how the Navajo Nation has their policy and we follow their lead on this issue. And in most cases, a lot of cases like traditional cultural properties, you cannot recognize them unless you do ethnographic interviews. The policy the Navajo Nation has under the Heritage Historic Preservation Department is you can access that policy on their website. Now, basically most cases, traditional cultural can only be identified through what, through ethnographic interviews, actually going out in the field and asking people about these Navajo people, local people, knowledgeable people, Hatafis, and so forth. So again, that's one of their policies. In addition to actually surveying the area, walking the area, they are required to talk to the local chapters. I know the Historic Preservation Department always encourages sponsors, contractors to contact local co um, chapters before they go out and try to talk to um, local people. In addition to that, they have to have a permit under the Alpha Nation Code, Title 17. Um, with that said, um, I hope I answered your question, Ms. Antinsu. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. I would like to see if any of the BLM archaeologists would like to add any additional information. Eric, are you online? And if you are, could you introduce yourself since we haven't heard from you yet and then provide any additional information, please? Hello, I am Eric Simpson, an archaeologist with the BLM in Farmington, New Mexico. Um, Mario, I, I remember one of our meetings before you brought up the um, comment that Mark made and actually went and tried to research that to see where that was coming from, um, that BLM doesn't uh, recognize Navajo Nation TCPs. And from what I could gather, um, he made a comment um, saying that, that the BLM personnel, so myself as an archeologist, might not be able to recognize Navajo Nation TCPs. As Robert said, um, you know, some of those aren't even known beyond the family that holds it significant. Um, so I, I believe that was where that comment came from as why that we do our ethnography, which is um, the reason we do our consultations with the Navajo Nation, um, with local community members. Um, you know, definitely um, we recognize the importance of TCPs, uh, traditional cultural properties, um, and a variety of other sites that might not neatly fit into that category um, through culturally important properties, um, which are definitely mentioned in the RMPA. Uh, they have a variety of, um, actually all the alternatives a, B, and C, with the exception of D and the no action alternative, have um, NSO distances provided for culturally important properties, um, as well as right-of-way exclusion distances. Um, so they are, are definitely under consideration here. 
um, I, I believe maybe that got to the to the question. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And what Eric means when he says NSO, he means no surface occupancy. And so that means that there would not be a well physically located within that setback distance. Um, we also have BLM Air Specialist Sheree Dixon that would like to provide some additional information for the question that you brought to us, Mario. Sheree, are you ready to respond? Um, hi, Mario. Thank you for your questions. And um, just like you, we're definitely concerned about air quality. It's my job. It's what I do. I'm passionate about it. And I take a lot of time looking into these issues. I did want to point out, if you get some spare time to look at page 312, 3-12 of the um, RMPA, it's table 3-6. It gives a historical um, concentration values for what the air quality is in the region. And you'll notice that some of the key pollutants that are related to oil and gas, which is ozone and nitrogen oxides, they're actually decreasing for our region. Um, the Navajo Nation, as well as New Mexico Environment Department, they monitor a lot of these key pollutants at the monitoring stations. And I would be happy to go over like how those changes have occurred. And, and that's, that's a key to the Navajo Nation. That's attributed to all of the participants when we join every year in the Four Corners Air Quality Group, in which the Navajo Nation is a part of that. And I've met with representatives from there to discuss air quality issues. So our ozone values, as well as our nitrogen oxide values, which are key pollutants related to oil and gas drilling, they are starting to decrease in the area. So I just wanted to point that to you. Um, that is happening. If you, you know, want to go over it, I'm, I'm available for you to go over that. Great. Thanks, Sheree. And thanks, Mario, for that set of questions. That was a lot of information you sent to us, and I hope uh, that we provided some insight uh, back to you. Uh, we do have a couple more hands raised. Mario, I see that you have your hand raised, and then Brandon, I see yours as well. I believe Mario has had his raised for a little bit. Um, so Mario, I'm going to be opening up your microphone in just a minute. I do ask, um, as we continue to move forward with this, um, we're getting a lot of really heavy questions, and it's not just one question. We're getting multiple questions, I believe, earlier. Today we had about six or seven questions wrapped up coming from one person. Um, if you wouldn't mind maybe breaking those up into sets, give us one or two questions, allow us to respond to those, and then go ahead and raise your hand again and we could get to your next set of questions. We do want to ensure that we're allowing opportunity for everyone on this call to ask us questions, and this is the best way that we feel that we're able to provide that opportunity. So Mario, I am opening up your microphone. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for some of those. Um, again, no one answered my question on uh, responding to us saying that, you know, just hear Lester tell Robert what to say. Um, this is you know, environmentally unjust. This is racism. Um, it's just me in a room, whereas the people need to be here, need to be. The quorum of a chapter house is probably enough consideration to get from a community. And again, we always have to say it'd be better if this was in person. I'm always going to lead with that. Um, so to respond, I guess uh, one thing is to say with changes to Quadro, Quadro A, NEPA itself, which we, we should require, you know, uh, significant changes in NEPA itself should really allow BIA to, to actually at least write a letter and CC tribal leaders to ask EPA to be on these calls, not just say it's always oh, our stuff. Communities are asking for that. We've been asking this for a while. Um, just because uh, the, just recognizing the tribe is, is going after uh, tribal NSR for the region, and those are highly effectual, uh, especially in terms of public health perspectives. But I'm going to focus on cultural resources, uh, and it, it kind of bleeds into my question to Maureen Joe. Um, reasonable foreseeable development. You say, oh, we, we're just, we're slave to the, the global marketplace. Um, and there's been no interruptions of royalty payments. 
um, I don't know who's on the call who has supervision over the Farmington Indian Minerals Office, but that's a bold faced lie. It's not a lie, and it shows you just how out of touch Marine Joe is with the local communities. My father's are, and I, I had to release private financial information to everybody on the call to do this, which is getting me really angry, but I'm going to do it anyways. Their royalty payments have dropped significantly, almost all the way to zero for the past two months. That's deeply effectual to communities. And so I don't know who's her boss, but they need to really sit her down and tell her what's really going on on the ground level. That's number one. And so that being the case, Reasonable foreseeable, foreseeable development plus the knocks and the socks and regard with federal you know, regional haze rules that are out there. And we just seen that I don't know how you guys say it. Uh, and the wilderness areas in and around Chaco are now wilderness, no longer study areas, but wilderness areas. I think subsequently have class one air standards now. Um, and kind of hard to trust a BLM person say, oh, the, the knock is going down. How is 4,000 new gigantic monstrous wells going to affect the socks and the knocks coming out of those and how that's going to affect visual resources, which are directly tied with ground level resources. I know it's hard for federal employees to think out of the box, out of their little box that they're put in, but the air resources plus the, you know, especially pre-Columbian roads are very significant. So you just see how intensely you put in linear features with pipeline called pipelines, and then you throw in air knocks that are coming down. How does routing to process or routing to destruction on, on end that are supposed to be written into Quado and Quado A, how is that? And then you change all of that midstream and then forces us to, to talk about these issues, those are deeply effectual to the cultural resources and how indigenous peoples use the landscape. So that's a lot of jumping around. And so I guess how do I really boil this down and make it simple? Cultural resources, especially under Section 800, and how those are affected, how is the reasonable foreseeable development going to affect that? And I think there might have been some and how the changes to Quado and Quado A are gonna do that. And that's just and that's just one thing. And so we have yet to even in this plan, it's hard to even get a finger on just trying to get BLM to adhere to the enhanced gold book standard when they allow midstream midstream infrastructure companies to come in and put in their roads and pipelines. Um, those might be eroding stuff. Um, that being said, we see we're talking about this, but we don't realize the elephant in the room is there's a million dollar cultural resource investigation put forth by Ben Ray Lujan's office. And they're supposed to be doing all of this stuff, creating a programmatic agreement. We're putting the cart before the horse without proper consultation when it comes to, to cultural resources. And so you said to make things more simple, I think I made it very complicated, but that's that's what I'm trying to explain is that all of these things have deep effects of cultural resources. How are you going to make sure and mitigate that doesn't affect regarding all of the, the, the whole multitude of federal laws regarding uh, regional haze, et cetera. Thanks, Mario. Um, I think we're gonna hand it over to Maureen Joe from Federal Indian Merrill's office to begin, and then we'll get some of our additional ID team members online to respond. Maureen. Thank you. Thank you, yes. I, I'm really happy that we're having this outreach because sometimes we don't necessarily either present the question correctly or on our end, we misunderstand the question. So to re-clarify what you're asking is basically, why is the royalty dropping? There's a number of things that happen. Number one, 
there was a letter that was sent out from the company back in April, basically letting the allottees know that if they are a part of, if they have their leased by this company, this company is shutting in their production for half of April, all of May, and part of June of 2020 as a result of the pandemic. As I had mentioned, because nobody, everybody is being told to stay home, the products are not being used, which is creating an inventory on the back end. And so when companies are extracting that product, there's no place for them for it to go, they can't process it because there's the inventory is high. So the best solution was to um, was to shut in those oil production, not gas. It was just oil. So when production is extracted on a given month, for an example, in April. That royalty doesn't report until the end of the second month. So any extraction that happened in April, royalties will not be paid on that extraction in April until July. So that is why you're seeing or your parents or any of the allottees that get oil revenue, a reduction in their oil revenue for what was paid out for July, August, and it may hit some of September because some of those wells started coming back on mid June and the wells back on for oil production. Now, just because those wells came back on doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be getting the same amount of revenues they've been getting a year ago because the second thing is that because of the pandemic, those oil prices have really dropped as well as the gas prices. So things are beginning to try to, they're, they're settling back in. Who knows what the market's gonna say? So that is all documented and that has all been put in letter form and sent to the lawsies for explanation now my my immediate boss is mr bart stevens if you have issues concerns comments you can direct it at him thank you thanks maureen for your response i'd uh, like to see if robert the gay is available if you could provide some additional information uh, um, for Mario's questions regarding perhaps uh, the effects on cultural resources that are being considered in this draft document. Thank you, Jill. And Mario, I will address a couple of your concerns or your questions concerning cultural resources. Unfortunately, we, we don't, <laughs> asking us that what are the impacts on cultural resources um, in the future and foreseeable uh, future because of the development. Because of those um, development, the Navajo Nation on trust land, the Navajo Nation does have policies. Basically, you can find that in the supplemental report, what those policy is and how to mitigate some of those um, impacts. Um, in addition to that, the $1 million question that you have on the, on the ethnographic study, that $1 million is actually directly coming out of this, um, the assistant secretary's, um, uh, Tara Sweeney's, um, the, um, office and BIA at Navajo region really has no control nor has any management responsibility over that $1 million um, ethnographic study proposal. 
I do understand that the Napa Nation Thipo has presented a uh, proposal to uh, to request part of that money to do an ethnographic study on behalf of the Napa Nation. Second, uh, to address some of the uh, potential impacts in the future on cultural resources because of the oil and gas development on trust lands. And basically, right now, under Section 106 consultation, and in the last year, we have been meeting with all our consulting parties and drafting, and with the other tribes, including the Navajo Nation, and drafting the programmatic agreement, and which is being close to, should be done before the record of decision is signed. Um, but in any case, if you have additional questions, again, feel free to call me at my office, 505-863-1565, or Sarah Scott on the issue. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. And Sarah's contact information, her phone number is 505-564-7683. And Rick Fields indicated that he would like to respond to your question as well. Rick? Thank you, Jill. Uh, Mr. Atencio, you mentioned about reasonable foreseeable development and 4,000 new wells. Um, reasonable foreseeable development does not factor in market conditions and, and the price. It looks like what is the geological maximum uh, from these areas? Uh, over the at least the past two years, and I think there could be more, but for at least the past two years, uh, more wells have been taken offline in the uh, Farmington Field Office than have come online. Uh, and that's a, a direct reflection and the changes in technology and also um, the age of some of the wells that we have. A lot of the wells that have been drilled in this farm, uh, Farmington Field Office, go back decades. And as they are taken offline, the newer wells that are going on are being built with uh, more modern equipment. There are um, compressor stations that are going on uh, that replace older facilities. And so the things that are coming online now are um, more uh, friendly to the environment than the ones that are being taken offline. And it's been a significant number of the old wells that are uh, coming offline, and a lot of them are from uh, the coal bed methane wells instead of from the Mancus Gallup Shale. But uh, I just wanted to, to point that out, that there is a, a significant change in the number of wells and the age of the wells, and also with the uh, newer horizontal drilling, um, there is less surface disturbance than there had been with the traditional um, vertical drilling, because you can get the same production out of a pad with um, a number of wells than you would have had from say 10 uh, independent vertical pads. So um, I, I just wanted to make you aware that the market forces are not a factor of the RFD and the market is definitely not trending where we are going to have thousands of wells um, coming online, but we do need to forecast that in case the conditions change or they make another technological development where it's a possibility this would be the maximum um, capability of the geologic formations. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mario, for your questions and the team for responding to those questions. Uh, I do want to remind our audience today that we are continuing to take questions today. We will be here until 4 p.m. today. And then we will also be having additional virtual open houses all the way through Saturday. Uh, today's focus group is for the Navajo Nation and the Navajo tribal community. And with that, we are, uh, we are available to take your questions if you prefer to give them to us in the Navajo language. We have translators available to help us relay our responses back to you. Um, if you are joining by phone, it does look like we have quite a few folks that are joining us by phone, and you would like to ask us a question today, please press star 9 on your telephone, and that will let me know that you're ready to provide your question, and we will go to you as soon as we see your hand raised. Um, and if you are joining on the Zoom platform, you could either send us a question using the Zoom chat box at the bottom of your screen there, 
just click in that and it'll send us your question and we can read it out loud and our team can work to respond to that question. Um, or you could use the raise hand feature on your Zoom platform to notify us. Um, Clayton, can you go back also to the how to provide your comments for the RMPA real quick? There we go. Okay. So we do encourage you to provide your comments for the draft EIS um, using any of these mechanisms. You could use all of these. Either way, we're going to get your comments. Um, so you can provide them by going online to the BLM's e-planning website. If you're joining by phone, I can read this for you. That web address is www.blm dot g o v forward slash n m forward slash farmington if you prefer to leave us a voicemail comment you can use the following phone number to do that that phone number is seven two zero two one three five seven eight six or you can provide your comments by mailing them to either of our project managers. Sarah Scott at, for BLM is at the address of 6251 College Boulevard. That's in Farmington, New Mexico, 87402. Or you can send them to Robert Begay at 301 West Hill Avenue in Gallup, New Mexico, 87301 and comments must be received by September 25th. September 25th will end our 210 day public comment period for this draft EIS. I do see we do have another comment or another person with their hand raised. So I'm going to go on to the next question. Uh, Brandon, I'm going to open up your microphone. Once I do this, let's do a quick sound check to make sure we can hear you and then you can continue with your question. Hello. Hi, Brandon. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great, great. Hello, everybody. I hope uh, everyone is doing well under the conditions right now. now this has been a very difficult process uh, for planning for the last few years, quite a few years. You know, these are much more difficult times right now, especially. Um, based on some of the stuff that I heard a little bit earlier, I uh, ended up writing a multi-part question. So I'll try to segment it uh, into definable pieces for you guys to answer, if possible. Um, just real quick, um, I know uh, Rick, um, Mr. Fields has done some great work in the past, but uh, just as a reminder, which I know everybody knows on this call here, that number of wells is not necessarily the same as intensity of impact. Um, I've had this firsthand experience out in Counselor with the uh, uh, previous smaller uh, vertical wells that were much older versus these new horizontal um, industrialized entities that exist out there. And uh, with the economic downturn right now, uh, it's interesting to actually be able to experience counselor as it was back in 2008 uh, before the horizontal boom hit in that community. So uh, some of those environmental factors such as sound and other types of quality qualities of that area uh, were reemerging again as well. Now with uh, some of that ticking back up again, we're starting to see that incrementally decline. So it was kind of an interesting reminder to see how it was before uh, the horizontal boom mountain counselor. Anyways, uh, first uh, first point that I just wanted to bring up is that you know part of the issue here is that the quote unquote community alternative that has been proposed pretty much doesn't seem all too different from full blown field development, at least for the BLM. Most of my comments will be exacted at the BLM uh, for their alternatives, not necessarily at the BIA. And I believe that a big part of this has to do with the fact that when these alternatives were initially developed back in, I believe it was 2014, 
there was no tribal representation at that table. None. Zero. The BIA was not even present at that table. I know that. I chatted with people that had discussions about this. Now, we had brought this up as an issue. On top of that, uh, OHO and Sino chapter, of which I am currently a representative of as the, oh, as the Community and Economic Development Advisor back then and currently, uh, was considering to become a cooperating agent so they could have a seat at that table in 2014 when these initial alternatives were discussed, in which the community alternative was one of them that was brought up. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, management was fairly, we had a fairly negative meeting regarding cooperating agency status for OHO and Sino chapter. Thankfully, with another change in management, I believe at the time when Victoria Barr came online, that attitude changed. That's to give you a uh, statement that that's when Victoria Barr came online was to give you an idea of approximately the time frame. And then within a few months, OHO and Sino was a cooperating agent. But before that, when these initial alternatives were constructed and the foundations of this plan was built, no tribal representation sat at that table, including the BIA, which dumbfounded me at the time. I find it uh, saddening because we can see this now in the community alternative, because the question we have continued to ask is, whose community is this alternative for? Because I believe uh, uh, Lester Sosi, Superintendent Sosi, who does incredible amounts of um, analysis and work, we have a great deal of respect for, brought up a key element uh, with the BIA's decisions on alternatives, which is economic impact. So the question is then, whose community is benefiting from this alternative? Because every analysis I have done with oil and gas production within at least Councillor does not seem to show an overwhelming amount of economic benefit being gained by the community of Councillor. I can probably expand this to some of the other surrounding Malibu communities as well, too. So that economic benefit is an important element of how the BLM is making its decision within Eastern Agency. This is important. The BIA should also be uh, making sure that it's keeping on the BLM about this to ensure that this economic benefit is accruing if this is the quote unquote community alternative. However, I suspect that by community alternative, it means the counties, it means the municipalities in which oil and gas is based. I believe this is what is meant by community alternative, not Navajo community alternative. And by the way, Ojo and Sino and the Tri Chapter have consistently provided throughout the entire process as much as possible potential alternatives to help uh, ensure that these things that occur on BLM lands within Eastern Agency boundaries benefit these community members and try to balance out and mitigate some of these impacts. Currently, right now, as it stands, millions of dollars are being produced within Councilor Chapter, which is going to Sandoval County, Santa Fe, State of New Mexico, San Juan County, and to the Treasury Department up there in Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, I just did a CARES Act um, infrastructure uh, request in which it was astounding to see the quantities of people who don't have running water or electricity. Just going to bring this up again. I know this is outside the BLM's purview, but this is this is within your analysis need for the balance of impacts that are occurring within these communities. Now I'll bring it into the second point why this becomes even more important. You're dealing within the Eastern Agency. Unfortunately, our friends at the BIA have been very quiet about the fact that the BIA Eastern Agency has contiguous boundaries. These boundaries are not discontiguous. They are contiguous. You can go to the website, you can see those boundaries. Now I'll go into some laws that are important for this. The first one is federal, the Indian Land Consolidation Act that was passed in 1986. I don't know if your people have taken time to take a look at how planning on BLM lands, since those are federal trust 
those are federal lands, how that is impacted by the Indian Land Consolidation Act. Navajo Nation in 1988 passed their, passed their own Navajo Land Consolidation Act. That was CMY, I'll give you the, the thing so that way you guys can write it down, do the research on this. CMY-23-88, passed by the Navajo Nation Council. And the approved amendments to that, CO-4388, was also approved by the Navajo Nation Council. This is called the Navajo Land Consolidation Act, which was prompted by the Indian Land Consolidation Act. This was signed off and approved by the United States Department of Interior, January 1989. Now, later on, when you look at some of the later resolutions, for example, CO 47 12, which is either directly or indirectly related to the Indian, to the Navajo Land Consolidation Act, it does refer to CMY 23 88 by stating that all of the lands of the Eastern Navajo Agency are within the Navajo Land Consolidation Area. So within Navajo law, we have passed resolutions and law that states that all lands within the Eastern Navajo Agency are within the Navajo Land Consolidation Area. We have brought this up consistently to both BLM and BIA that once you begin dealing inside the Eastern Agency boundaries, you are dealing in a whole new territory. This is not like planning in some rural area where there's no tribal entity is with land holdings. This is different. If you go to seven, um, Title Seven Navajo Nation Code 254, Territorial Jurisdiction of the Navajo Nation. I'll go ahead and just read that to you real quick. Part A, Territorial Jurisdiction of the Navajo Nation shall extend to the Navajo, to Navajo Indian Country which is defined as all land within the exterior boundaries of the Navajo Indian Reservation or, and this is importantly, of the Eastern Navajo Agency. It also goes on to continue with some of the other elements which usually define Navajo Indian country. But what's important is here, it defines Navajo Eastern Agency. This is something we have brought up so many times, Steve, BLM and BIA. What has been disturbing, I understand why the BLM maybe didn't know how to handle this, but what disturbs me is why hasn't the BIA spoken up on this matter? And every time I've heard excuses, it's always been it's discontiguous boundaries, but everything I have indicates that this is not the case, and this comes from Navajo Nation law. The Tri Chapter and Oho and Sino Chapter as cooperating agents had brought up a special management area which was the Navajo Nation areas with Eastern Agency areas within the planning area for this RMPA. That was denied. There are good reasons for this. I was grateful for, uh, for uh, Mr. Begay's uh, comments from the BIA when he brought up some of the first elements of Diné natural law. So this is Title I, Navajo Nation Code, Part 205. Diné National uh, Natural Law declares and teaches that, discusses in Part A the four elements that was brought up earlier, discusses the six um, mountains, mountains. But here's another important part right here. Part C and D. The whole thing is important, but Part C. This has cultural uh, implications. All creation from Mother Earth and Father Sky to the animals. Those who live in water, those who fly and plant life have their own laws and have rights and freedom to exist. And, Part D, the Diné have a sacred obligation and duty to respect, preserve, and protect all that was provided for. We were designated as the steward of these relatives through our use of sacred gifts of language and thinking. Then if you go to Part F, the rights and freedoms of the people to use the sacred elements of life as mentioned above and to use land, natural resources, and sacred sites and living beings must be accomplished through the proper protocol 
of respect and offering and these practices must be protected and preserved for they are the foundation of our spiritual ceremonies in Diné Lifeway. And Part G, it is the duty and responsibility of the Diné to protect and preserve the beauty of the natural world for future generations. This has huge amounts of cultural resource implications. And this is something that we have been saying from the tri chapter is when you come in and you do this development, you have these impacts on cascading relationships across the land. The relationships are sacred in this respect and how those relationships are then considered, respected, preserved. That's also important as well. So I'll go ahead, I'll just end with this final one, but I do have some other questions though uh, later, which is based on everything with Eastern Agency, the legalities of Eastern Agency and planning, why does the Navajo Nation president not have consistency review for all of the Eastern Agency lands? Not just tribal trust, not just uh, allotment, but BLM lands in particular since those are federal lands within the Indian land consolidation area, which is federal law and also Navajo Nation law. So, and I apologize if I sound a little on edge. It's just, I know we've been talking about this for so many times and we've been talking about this for so many years. It'd be really great to hear something from BLM and especially BIA on some of these issues as to why this uh, wasn't necessarily applied or considered deeply when we were considering some of the alternatives in the past. So uh, thank you and look forward to talking to you guys some more. Hey, Brandon, before you mute yourself completely, I want to uh, make sure that I'm actually capturing the questions you are wanting us to respond to today. You did provide us some excellent comments and we do look forward to seeing those in your formal comment submissions. Um, but what I do have is whose community is Alternative C actually representing? Um, and then also why is the BLM not required to do a Navajo Nation consistency review for our plan? And then, but I'm not sure that it was very clear to me. Could you let me know what that other one might be? Uh, yeah, sure, that would be good. Yeah, and, and the, uh, the consistent review, consistency review is, the question is then also predicated on all the legalities that I had mentioned before on Eastern Agency as a contiguous boundary. Because I could understand that in an other situation why the president wouldn't have it. But in this situation, because of Eastern Agency, this is different. Um, the other question is, is why then considering the, the unique nature of Eastern Agency, both legally, socially, demographically, was the why the alternative uh, making that a special management zone or area could not have been considered. We never had a definite reason for that. We were not told it was outside the scope of the RMPA. So I just want to say that in case that's the go-to answer everybody wants to go to very fast. And then I guess just, uh, yeah, I'll keep it to those three. That sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying, Brandon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and send your questions to Rick. Rick, are you on and ready to respond? Sure. Um, and I'll address the ones that are specific to BLM, and then you can jump over to get BIA's comments. Um, you asked what community benefits, and you are correct. Community does not just mean Navajo communities, but on the BLM side, we are not writing just a Navajo document. And so we take the greater community, uh, which for us is the Four Corners region of the um, state of New Mexico, or our field office and the communities therein, um, as what we look at for benefits. Um, <clears throat> And keeping that in mind, um, you, you also had asked 
uh, about the royalties, and I know we've had this conversation before, that uh, we have no authority over um, how royalties are dispersed. That's done through Congress, and currently the 12.5% uh, royalty rate goes to uh, the states as opposed to tribes, and that is something that can only be changed by uh, working with your congressional representatives and trying to get the law um, changed so that minerals extracted from um, areas within the jurisdiction would go to it. The minerals uh, royalties on um, a lot of these lands, of course, goes to them as opposed to going to uh, other people. So um, you had a lot of um, input about Indian Land Consolidation Act and its amendments and the Navajo Land Consolidation Act. Uh, and you talked about Eastern Agency. Uh, the BLM manages BLM lands and they are lo located within the jurisdictional area of the Eastern Agency, but we manage them using federal laws, regulations, and policies. Uh, with respect to the um, laws passed by Navajo Nation, um, and I do not mean this to slight anyone, but the Navajo Nation laws do not apply to federal lands because federal lands are governed by the laws, regulations, and policies of the federal government. Uh, and you, you mentioned, but again, that does not apply to the federal lands. Um, also going along with that, um, we did not address land tenure in this plan. And if anyone's on that does not understand what I mean about land tenure, it's uh, about ownership, disp disposal of land and such. That is addressed in the 2003 RMP, but this amendment did not address it. So um, as far as consolidating lands and uh, other things, and it's come up recently in like, the Dingle Act and um, other previous laws, that is all outside of the scope of this um, RMPA. And uh, to, finally, to get to your consistency review question, the governor's consistency review is laid out in uh, FLIPMA, and that is our organic act. It was written in the 70s, and that detailed that we had to um, consult with the states and have their governors do a review of any planning documents to make sure they are consistent with the laws of the, um, the state. And then if there's a conflict, we try and work that out with the state. Uh, but there is not anything like that, unfortunately, in the um, in, in FLIPMA or any uh, follow-up laws that provide for that in our planning to give a consistency rule um, review to tribes. And with that, I am going to step back and uh, let our BIA um, folks address your concerns. Great. Thanks so much, Rick. Robert, would you and your team like to provide some additional information to this discussion? Or Superintendent Sosi, if you're available. We're unable to hear the microphones. You may need to uh, unmute on our side, Jill. Can you hear me, Teresa? I'm sorry, Jill, I can hear you. I meant we may have to uh, help Maureen unmute. Oh, okay. If, if you're unable to do that, I can. Okay, try it. I'm not sure what's happening. Maureen, can you hear us? There it goes. Yes, uh, this testing, this is Superintendent Sosi here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Superintendent. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and answer that uh, question that's really layered with different types of ideas and concepts and things like that. But I want to focus more on jurisdiction for Eastern Navajo Agency. Brandon, thank you very much for, for that um, loaded question. You and I have had 
conversations in the past, really trying to, I think, coordinate and communicate on how we can address some of the community concerns within this complicated uh, jurisdiction within the Eastern Navajo Agency. Um, as you know, um, the Navajo Nation did uh, pass a resolution uh, reconsolidating lands in Eastern Navajo Agency years ago, as you cited earlier. Then two months ago, the current uh, 24th Navajo Nation Council reauthorized that resolution uh, with, with the idea of consolidating lands in Eastern Navajo Agency. Why they are doing that is because Eastern Navajo Agency is complicated as we try to address different issues and concerns, and also fighting by federal uh, regulations, laws, Navajo codes, and Navajo laws. Um, just as examples, um, we do recognize, respect Navajo Nation laws and codes in this one example in issuing grazing permits. Um, Eastern Navajo Agency, like I said, has 23 land status. So when we work on grazing permits and issuing that, we recognize the land board through Navajo Nation Code Title III, which lays out the roles and responsibilities of Navajo officials addressing grazing and range management in coordination with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's one example where we work closely with the Navajo Nation and recognize their laws. The other part of that, just related again as an example, is the BIA, BLM, um, and the Navajo Nation implemented the cooperative agreement for range management back in the 60s. Um, again, that agreement, and some people call it the MOU agreement, also uh, delineates roles and responsibilities in range management, as well as looking at issuing grazing permits. Um, that was a concerted effort that happened by previous Navajo leaders working with BIA officials and BLM officials. Prior to that, BLM used to uh, be managing, I think all the grazing permits mm -hmm. for even Navajo land. But today we use that cooperative agreement to uh, manage um, issuing grazing permits. The other area is that the Nomination Council is really, I think, focused on trying to address these challenges. Uh, simple things like how does a Navajo family, uh, perhaps living on a public domain land at Eastern Navajo Agency, get utility connection? Because that's something very real and that's, that's out there. People ask for that. So they have um, been reviewing and working with other uh, Navajo um, entities, DOJ, trying to, to finalize the NELI, the Navajo Initiative for Reconsolidating Land. So I just wanted to share some of those examples on how BIA does recognize and respect Navajo Nation sovereignty and Navajo Nation laws and codes that are out there. We also do work with BLM in certain areas as it pertains to specific land status. Thank you very much. Hopefully that provides some um, insight into it. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. So we are continuing to take your questions today. Um, if you'd like to provide a question, if you're joining us by Zoom, please use the raise hand feature on your computer. If you are joining by the phone and you'd like to ask us a question, please press star nine, and that'll notify us that you're ready to provide your question. Um, I don't see that we have any questions that have come in through chat yet. So Sarah, I don't have any hands raised. I don't um, have any callers ident identifying that they wanna provide a question. Is there something you wanna talk about while we're here? And Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah, before we go down that road, right as I was speaking, Brandon raised his hand again. So, Brandon, I'm going to open up your microphone and let's do another sound check. Can you hear me? I can. Thanks, Brandon. 
thank you for the on the fly answers. I know that these are um, these are kind of deep, complex questions. So I just want to make sure that we keep having that conversation about this because it's uh, really important um, and also foundational to everything right here. So um, thank you, Rick, and thank you, Lester, for the answers. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll find something more satisfactory. And just as a reminder to the BIA, these are resolutions from the Navajo Nation Council. And the BIA works for tribes. Um, but sometimes uh, you can see where the loyalties have to go, since uh, we all know where the uh, funding comes from for the BIA. But I know you guys are doing the best you can based on the legalities and other situations that are occurring. So thank you for the answers. Uh, I guess uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up was uh, this got brought up with uh, air quality improving across the region. Uh, I know that the chapter, Oho and Sino chapter and Tri chapter both have an issue with the idea of using higher air quality as a bank or as a way for you to take out a loan to decrease the air quality again. Um, I'll focus on particulate matter. Uh, basically, I believe it's the New England Journal of Medicine, probably about a year ago, finally came out with multiple articles and uh, peer reviewed articles. And then finally, just an editorial indicating the fact there are no safe levels of particulate matter. And that even temporary bumps in PM levels uh, increase mortality and other issues within communities that are facing even temporary increases in particulate matter. Interestingly enough, when we have read documents, uh, NEPA documents out of uh, the Rio Puerco field office, you guys' sister's office down, sister office down to the south, uh, they had mentioned that this is just merely a, a nuisance. Uh, we, we tend to find this more than that, and the medical literature has also concluded that even temporary uh, bumps in PM levels is more than a nuisance. When we've had development inside Counselor, we have reported levels that were just off the charts. And a lot of this comes from the fact that most, almost all the roads within Counselor that serve the community are dirt. These dirt roads then have to sustain these massive industrial facilities, which require hundreds and hundreds of heavy trucks loaded to the gill with materials to come in and that increases PM levels within the area, not to mention any kind of increases which occur from the industrial sites themselves. So I guess then also I just want to indicate too that there's also another environmental justice element to this, which is the fact that um, communities which are at a disadvantage economically or in some other way tend to face a disproportionate impact from these increased PM levels. And then there's also another whammy that hits people out in this area. The fact is, if you come from an area that has relatively clean air, and then your air, even if temporarily, is then polluted with higher PM levels, there's a second additional hit. So if you're in a community which is um, let's say uh, disadvantage for different reasons from lack of medical access or economic resources, and then already traditionally has clean air, relatively speaking, compared to a city, and then they get these hits on their PM level, the amount of impact to them, especially in terms of mortality, but in health, is even much more higher increased. So. We have the medical literature on that. We can resubmit it. This is pretty well documented within, within various journals and peer-reviewed journals. So this probably is not something new for anybody that deals with this kind of stuff. I would assume that you at least have a couple folks within your agencies that know this and understand this. So um, I'm just curious on how you're addressing this. Even though I understand the EPA has its quote unquote, safe levels, there's a whole other environmental justice aspect to this, which uh, goes beyond those safe levels that need to be addressed, especially considering the conditions of the communities in which these activities are occurring. So thank you. 
Great. Thanks, Brandon. And again, I highly encourage you to submit a lot of information that you provided us today as a formal comment. Um, just as a reminder, we are taking questions and responding to uh, our attendees' questions today. And so these aren't, we're not accepting formal comments. But I will go ahead and send the microphone to Sarah. Sarah, do you and your team want to address some of Brandon's concerns on air quality and how we are addressing them in the draft EIS? Sure. Thanks, Jill. Um, and there's a few uh, a few components to it. Um, so first, let's go to Sheree. You want to talk a little bit about the, the PM standard and whose jurisdiction that is? Oh, absolutely. So those are all good questions and I really appreciate those questions and it sounds like you're well versed in, you know, the EPA's role with particulate matter is both PM 2.5 and PM 10. Um, the PM 2.5 is traditionally what we'll see from um, industrial combustion. Um, the PM 10 is typically what you would see on the roads from the dust and travel of vehicles. Um, different things like that. And that definitely is out of the scope of this RMPA or this draft RMPA. Um, I can say that the EPA does review those regulations for what's considered um, healthy for the public. There's primary and there's secondary standards to protect both health and aesthetic um, levels of particulate matter. And I would definitely participate in those reviews that the EPA has. There are local things though that can be done and should be addressed as it refers to dust um, during the construction phase and the operations phase. And I will pass that on to Whitney Thomas or Lee Thomas and our um, part of our ID team. Hi, uh, yeah, my name is Whitney Thomas, and um, again, I'm physical science with school for farming and field office. Um, as it pertains to the particulate matter um, caused by the dust due to the construction and um, increased use of um, roads during the initial phases of the construction and drilling of an oil well, one of the conditions of approval that we had require on APDs is the use of dust to be. Um, and that is to water down the roads to decrease the, the particulate matter in the air during those heavy use um, phases of, of a um, oil and gas well. Um, in order to um, better manage um, reclamation and soil stability, we do um, require reclamation and rec plans and the rec reclamation of the soils to occur within six months of um, a well being put into production. And to better um, answer that question on reclamation, I'd like to refer to Heather Perry um, within our natural resources service shop. Yes, hi, my name is Heather Perry. I'm a natural resource specialist in the Farmington BLM office. And regarding the reclamation side of what we do here at the BLM is we do have several um, conditions of approval that we have lined out in our RMPA as well as a few um, NOS, so non-surface occupancy possibilities. Um, that's kind of regarding what is considered a fragile soil. So a soil that might be more susceptible to erosion due to disturbances. Um, and regarding um, uh, onshore order, we're required to have a service use plan uh, submitted by the operator in which they will lay out the area of disturbance, how they plan to reclaim it both in an interim as well as our final reclamation. And then that includes kind of looking at where we're gonna place roads or pipelines. Are there ways that we can minimize disturbance by utilizing already existing areas, um, whether that be within a pipeline corridor that exists, can we pair that up with another one? Can we use um, an existing uh, well, um, road to get to the majority of the new location. So all these little things that we try to 
to um, pair together, help us reduce the overall disturbance out there on the landscape. Um, seed choices, uh, we try to match up with what is already existing out there because that demonstrates what the land can support naturally. So we come back with that. And then if there is topsoil, we have them re um, put that off to the side during the initial construction and then come back on and put that topsoil, reseed it in cases, mulch it to help minimize um, any sort of erosion and air travel by topsoil and also allows us to, um, I guess, uh, preserve the biological community of that soil within it. So we, we have a variety of different methods that we work with the operators on, as well as requirements by onshore oil um, orders, as well as what we have as conditions of approval at the time of looking at a location to, um, to do construction for oil and gas. So I hope um, that answers some of your questions, Brandon, and Feel free to reach out to me or any of our other natural resource specialists here for um, further reclamation guidance that we work with um, out there. Thank you. Thanks, Heather and Whitney and Sheree. Um, that's great information. And I'll, I'll just reiterate uh, that what Heather said about reaching out to us if you need more info on any of that. And I'll toss it back to you, Jill. Great, again, yes, thanks to our team for the responses and Brandon for your questions. Um, we do have two attendees with their hands raised, so we will go to them shortly. I do wanna give a reminder on how you can provide your questions today before we get to them. If you are joining by Zoom, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom screen, and that will notify us that you're ready to provide a question or if you're joining us by phone, you could press star nine, and this also gives us a little notification that you're prepared to uh, provide us your question. If you're joining by phone and want to provide a question, your hand is raised, I'll identify you by the last four digits of your phone number, and then we'll do a sound check and we'll, be, uh, we'll open up your microphone. You can also provide your questions through the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. If you don't feel like speaking in front of this audience, you can still provide your question. We can read it out loud and our team will work to respond to your questions. So I will be going to our next uh, person with their hand raised and it is Brandon again. Brandon, let's again, just do another microphone check. And you can begin with your question. Hi, can you hear me again? I can, thanks Brandon. Um, just a quick follow up. Uh, based on what uh, Sheree, uh, then Whitney, and then Heather had mentioned. Um, I didn't quite catch what exactly was outside the scope in regards to dust production uh, from this. I believe, uh, Sheree, you had mentioned something as being outside the scope. I was just hoping for some clarification, and my apologies if I missed what you had said. And then for Whitney, um, you were mentioning that the dust would be handled at the APD level, um, but I guess the concern that we have at the local governmental level is the fact that these are large scale impacts, especially if we're considering 4,000 well sites going in or however many well sites will eventually be uh, determined. Um, we've seen these impacts at the ground level and they're very significant. So, I, We've gotten this before, the, don't worry about it, wait until the APD level. And then by the time it gets to the APD level, they tell us, well, that had to be something that had to be handled at the RMP level. So uh, what's being done to make sure that these uh, major impacts are being handled at the RMP level correctly, so that way, or RMPA level correctly, so that way when we get down to the APD level, we're not scrambling and this circular argument takes place again. Um, which we've been in the midst of many, many times, which I know is frustrating for both BLM and us uh, at the local governmental level. And then finally to Whitney, um, this is a little unrelated to dust, but it brings up a key element that we've brought up, which has cultural, but also ecological, is the um, when there's replanting of seeds back out there to replace whatever was lost, um, it's not always exactly the same species or subspecies, 
but even if it is of the same subspecies, um, we would we feel pretty confident that the genetic makeup of whatever being brought in, especially when it comes to plants, because the genetic makeup of plants gets kind of crazy and interesting. It's fun to study. But if you're bringing in seed stock from another part of the country, even if it's the same subspecies of plant, we suspect that the micro adaption of the populations that we have in our area, which has cultural impacts as well too, are gonna to be different. So if you're bringing in these, uh, let's say quote unquote foreign subspecies, even though technically you can claim that it's the same plant, what's being done to ensure that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, species of plants that are in the area are being maintained at a genetic level and not necessarily being uh, having other variations of those subspecies being brought in, which may have completely different, or not completely, but somewhat different genetic makeup, which could have impacts, cascading impacts on the uh, cultural and landscape levels. So thanks, those are my three questions. And I'll, uh, I'll reserve further questions so much later. So thank you. Great, thanks for following up with us, Brandon. So we're gonna go ahead and go back to Sheree. Sheree, after you give us some of your input, we'll follow up with Whitney and then Heather, thanks. Hi, Brandon, these are all great conversations and questions and I do appreciate it. And I apologize if I mischaracterized your um, statement or question, but I did understand that you were asking as far as what the standards were for particulate matter and as you know, I I'm, I'm don't want to minimize your intelligence or what you know, I'm sure you know that um, the EPA sets those standards for particulate matter and we can't adjust those standards. So that's what I was saying was out of the scope of the RMPA. If you have another question, I'd be glad to um, follow up and answer that. That's That was my statement for out of scope. And then um, I'll follow up, Brandon, to just kind of talk a little bit about um, the conditions of approvals that are addressed in the, the AP, at the APD phase. So um, those conditions of approval that we are um, a, attaching to the APDs are being analyzed at the RMPA level as well. Um, and we want to make sure that um, th those site-specific analyses are, are occurring and that those specific conditions of approval are attached to each project as they come into um, the, the Farmington field office to ensure that um, operators are complying with, with those um, conditions and stipulations as um, they're implementing the projects on the ground. Heather, go ahead. And Brandon, to your um, question on genetics with native seeds, um, I think this is an awesome question. It's something that um, across the Bureau has been brought up and it is a relatively new um, idea that people are um, grasping onto to look into further. And currently um, we are working with USGS actually starting to do that. They've already started some of this work out of our vernal office looking into genetics and native um, seed sources and the differences there because yes um, even if it is the same species sometimes the species may be better adapted to a particular area um, that it it resides in um, uh, say sagebrush that's up along the foothills in um, some of the mountainous ranges in Colorado could be very different um, than the sagebrush that is down in the Farmington field office, even though they're both still on the Colorado plateau. So those are things that um, we think about and we're trying to consider. It's difficult because um, a lot of seed companies um, don't have the capability currently to collect in a very localized area. Um, it, and that's where what we're trying to look into with, with USGS, um, um, the US Geological Survey um, Department of Interior uh, Agency, we're trying to see if in our area of uh, the Colorado Plateau as well as San Juan Basin um, has a genetic difference or 
shows that there are particular species that are adapted and can do better in um, in the area. You know, one of the concerns is even if it's not the same subspecies, there are some that there are species that will be great in this area, and it allows us to compete against um, possible invasion of invasive species. So that's another part of the puzzle that we try to keep um, a pulse on is making sure that we get that ground covered with the native plants, um, you know, and we're looking into that question of whether um, whether or not there's certain specific genetics for our area that will help with success and establishment of the native community, as well as just keeping those invasives uh, to a minimum of establishment. So it's it's a new thing. I've attended a few different um, uh, meetings and presentations as of late that there are several different groups that are looking into the specific genetics of plants and seeds and how they differ across maybe perhaps what they used to be lumped into the same exact landscape. Um, so all we can do is kind of try to make the best decisions we can with um, the available science and information we have and continue supporting looking into these types of um, questions that we all have. So that's a great question. I hope that helped answer that um, and just let you know that it is something that we are looking into in the pharmacy field office. Thank you. That's uh, great info. Thanks again, Sheree, Whitney, and Heather. And um, one thing I do want to add to that great information is um, that the goal of the seed mix is to stabilize the soil in the short term uh, with natural vegetation from the surrounding areas than to come in for the long term, which I think kind of ties back to uh, the original part of your question about um, dust abatement and all that. Um, and then I'll pass this over to BIA. Robert, do you uh, and your team want to add some info? Seed mixes? Yeah, super. Um, thank you, Jill. Um, I just wanted to um, address the native species issue. Uh, we do have a resource specialist, Dr. Curley. Dr. Curley, you want to address those issues? Albert, you're going to need to unmute yourself. I'm not sure about this RMP. Dr. Curley, are you online? Are you feeling hot and bothered? Me too. I need to take a break. You want to come downstairs, sweetie? Jill, can you hear me? Robert, I hear you and I see Calvert there. He just does not appear to be actually unmuting himself. Okay. Well, well, Dr. Curley's getting online. I understand a lot of these issues about native seeds and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, Dr. Curley will be the one to answer this question. Um, Robert, he was, he was able to unmute himself for a second there. She might be able to go to him now. Okay, I'm here. Hi, Calvert. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you, Calvert. You may need to mute your computer or or if you're using yep, that one. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, That's better. Can you repeat the question? I'm kind of getting some... Uh, I can't really, I didn't really catch the question. Uh, it was going in and out. So if you can repeat your question, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Robert, do you want to go ahead and repeat the question? Yes, Dr. Curl, Brandon's question was, what is the, the native species that is being used or is there native species or non-native species being used to uh, replant and reclamate, uh, do reclamations in the area. I do understand that he has concerns that there are genetic differences among native species 
Um, but on trust land, I know that Natural Resources has some of those issues, that has some of the same concerns on those. Um, he just wanted to know what the genetic makeup is or have we looked at the genetic makeup of native species that's used on reclamation on Napa Trust land. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Calvert Curley and I work for uh, Navajo Region branch of natural resources and your question regarding um, <clears throat> if we, what type of species do we use in, in case of uh, when there is a, um, a reseeding that's gonna happen in, in an area where it has been disturbed. So the <clears throat> majority of the time we have natural resource specialists. We also have soil uh, conservationists. And, and what, what happens is we would look at the area and utilize the ecological site description for that particular area and look at the type of soil that's there and based on the soil the type of vegetation that that should be growing in that area so anytime there's reseeding that is going to happen um, we always refer back to the soil type and the ecological site description though so that's how uh, reseeding takes place thank you Great, thank you, Dr. Curley, for adding to this discussion. So Brandon, you are continuously bringing us a lot of really great information. And if you have additional recommendations, as well as some of the studies that you've referenced today, please include all of that information in your formal comments. We do have the ways you can submit comments up on the screen right now. I'll go over those again in case we have folks joining by phone and they can't see what we have on the screen. You can provide your formal comments online by going to the BLM's e-planning page. That web address is www.blm.gov forward slash nm forward slash Farmington. You can also leave a comment as a voicemail if you use the following phone number. 720-213-5786. Or you can mail your comments to the BLM Project Manager, Sarah Scott, at 6251 College Boulevard, Farmington, New Mexico, 87402 or to the BIA project manager, Robert Begay, at 301 West Hill Avenue in Gallup, New Mexico, 87301. And as a reminder, our comment period ends on September 25th. And we are continuing to take your questions today. Uh, we are approaching three o'clock. We're gonna be here till 4 p.m. If you'd like to provide us with a question, please use the raise hand feature on your Zoom screen. Or if you're joining us by telephone, press star nine and that'll let us know you're ready to provide your comments. You can also use the Zoom chat, the Zoom chat function at the bottom of your screen if you'd prefer to just type your comment to us. Uh, we have another hand raised. Um, and I would also like to remind everyone that we are also able to accept comments in the Navajo language. We do have translators available to assist us in communicating back and forth with one another if you would like to communicate with us in that manner. So the next hand raised is of Mario. Mario, kind of same business as usual. I'm going to open your microphone. Let's do a sound check and then we can move on with your question. Can you hear me? I can, Mario. Thank you. Yes, I, I have a question. Just just um, two part or two different um, parts of the, uh, of the RMPA. Um, I think one with the, the native seeds. Um, we want to know, I guess you probably can answer this. Um, just went out to the Escovada unit um, near my grand, uh, my, my mother's and father's land holdings um the range unit out there which is 
held in trust by the BIA, I think. Um, there's pipelines put in place and you see that the natural landscape is a delicate mixture of cryptogamic, cryptobiotic soils that fix nitrogen with native grasses, with uh, which is commonly referred to as sagebrush steppe. Um, and then you put these huge linear features in and all you see is tumbleweed. I think they're called Russian thistle is the only thing that has come up. Uh, with reason why I'm bringing this up is that these midstream companies, uh, we'd like to see this section where they talk about this. Um, just letting the people who are making this decision for the planning area know that probably in the five years since some of these pipelines have gone in, there's been extreme damage to the, to the forage uh, holding capacity, I guess, animal unit capacities of these lands. And I don't, is that being analyzed in this plan with, with respect to uh, grazing? Otto, the next question is, I'm looking at um, the Great Roads and the Great Roads being identified in the RMP plus visual resources. It seems like there's a correlation between great house structures and the visual resources that have class, class one air re visual resource management. Um, is there been any discussion to protect the over 200 great houses that lie outside the cultural national historic park that may lie within the decision area? And what was the discussion behind that? And so that's a two parter. Um, my next question after you answer this question is going to be on wilderness lands. I think Congress has passed a law that has made as in wilderness, and not only that, but a chance to plot into wilderness, or do those have class one air? That's probably a three-parter, so I'm trying to keep it really simple. So that's what I have. Great. Thanks, Mario. I'm going to toss this over to Sarah, and Sarah's going to work with her ID team to begin responding to your inquiries. Thanks, Jill, and thanks for those good questions, Mario. Um, we'll go over to Jeff DeFoya to talk first about the first part of your question. Jeff? Hello, Hello Mario. Mario. Easy to not. Great. Hello, Mario. This is Jeff. Thanks for your question. Um, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the, uh, the seeding, the pipelines, the reclamation, uh, and the grazing. So, uh, your question was about, or some of the things that you stated mentioned that some of the areas that have been developed and have been seeded have Russian thistle growing on them. And, and yes, that does happen frequently. Uh, one thing that's very tough with reclamation in an arid environment like we've got right now, or that we live in, is uh, we don't just plant it and it grows like the next year had we irrigated it or we farm. It does take time. Uh, we require that companies either submit plans of development or a, super, a surface use plan of operation uh, to basically kind of um, address how they're going to keep an area stabilized, how they're going to protect soils, how they're going to revegetate it. And after that work is done, um, and when it's being done, it's inspected. But then we do frequent monitoring. And if in a certain amount of time, oftentimes two years, three years, if it's not coming up the way it should, uh, the operator of the company has to reseed it again or, or deal with it and address it. Uh, they can change their plan. They can propose different plants. They can propose mulch. Um, we have weed stipulations. Uh, conditions of approval, so they are responsible for managing their weeds if we come up on that on that disturbance or reclamation. Um, in terms of grazing, you stated that the uh, development is having a very large impact on grazing, and we've analyzed it numerous times, uh, numerous years, 
Um, I'll give you an example. During the fruit and coal uh, development here in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, more up here kind of northeast and uh, south, well, northwest or southeast of Farmington, what they call the fairway, an area of high development for fruit and coal. Uh, very frequently did we analyze the amount of disturbance in relation uh, to that impact on grazing. Um, I, I was, I'm a range con by trade. That's how I started my career. And I, I did have a lot of concerns with that. But after checking that acreage, um, seeing our reclamation plans, our interim reclamation, um, it, it typically amounts to a very small amount in grazing capacity. Uh, that it affects and then a lot of our projects if you ever look at a condition of approval package we have a lot of stipulations about safety uh, keeping livestock from harm keeping them out of hazards uh, those sorts of things um, I, I kind of hope that, that helps kind of answer how we do it and look at it Thanks, Jeff. Um, the second couple parts of the question, I, I might need a little another clarification on um, if you're looking uh, for information on air quality within those special areas like Wilderness or the Great Road. Um, are we still connected to him? Can we? Yep. I'm opening up. Oh, great. I'm opening your microphone, Mario. Yeah, just um, I'm looking at the visual resources. So kind of has uh, uh, its relation to regional haze, but was there discussion on the class one? It seems like I'm looking at figure 315, visual resource management. Um, it's like it's all centered around the park um, and around other great houses. Um, there's one that's purple, one that's light blue, yellow, green. Um, how, this, how were the decisions to make made for those resources and if it seems like there's outliers that are being protected um why what other discussions were made on maybe other outliers that we've seen on maps from now mission historic preservation department out there um i think one thing very much is very jumps out since we have uh, someone really highly knowledgeable navajo way of being and living as a worker for the BIA, um, that was incredibly important traditional cultural properties to Navajo people being and and the visual resources in that, um, what discussions were made in that? Um, I'm trying to look here um, and uh, we could never get, get that sort of talk out there. And so that's what the visual resources side. And then with the Denas in wilderness areas, the change in the status, I think through the Congressional Act that just happened maybe last year, two years ago, um, I think Tom Needall put that in. Um, do those new designations in the region, are, do they have class one air standards and should all these analysis include those in their effects to the to air quality? So that's, the, I think that's the two parts. Uh, I've been wanting to know right now. Okay, it's still a little uh, mixed together. So I think what I would like to do is have Jeff Haynes, could you talk a little bit about um, the, the protections around the Great Road uh, areas, the um, NSOs and that kind of thing? Yeah, this is uh, Jeff Haynes, archeologist at Farmington Field Office. Um, so the various alternatives do have uh, various protections for Chaco and outliers and roads outside of the park. Um, for instance, the outliers themselves, which uh, there are certain outliers designated uh, as, well, there, there's a few there park units. There are others that are uh, the Chaco out, mentioned in the Chaco Outliers Protection Act, uh, the, the Chaco Archaeological Protection Sites, that, that would be that group. 
And then there are others that are not specifically called out in any particular legislation. This would apply to that larger group, um, inclusive of those that are part of the park and also for the Chaco archeological protection sites. Um, across the different alternatives, trying to find, just jotted this down, but we basically have closures of anywhere from zero to three miles, uh, you know, depending on which alternative you're looking at, and then an, an additional NSOs anywhere from, you know, zero to five miles on top of that. So there's a, there's a wide range, um, you know, of no new uh, protections beyond those already offered under the Section 106 process. Um, which I would point out that we've been considering a lot of these more, you know, say like audiovisual effects uh, to sites of this of this kind uh, since 2015. Um, but there would be automatic protections depending on which alternative gets chosen that could extend out to eight miles. Thanks, Jeff. And then uh, can we go over to Stan to talk about the wilderness aspect of that? Sure. Um, so um, Mario was mentioning, uh, I'm Stan Allison. I'm an outdoor recreation planner with the BLM and I deal with wilderness and visual resource management and uh, appreciate your question, Mario, about the wilderness. Um, I wasn't quite clear exactly what you were getting at, but um, as you mentioned, the Dingle Act in 2019 uh, was recently passed, which expanded the Vista Denizen wilderness, and it converted the Ashishlapa wilderness from a wilderness study area to a wilderness. Um, part of that expansion included an area that had been inventoried for lands with wilderness characteristics in 2016, which contained part of the uh, Chaco North Road. And I know North Roads, or the Chaco Roads are one of your concerns. Um, that ACEC, that's a, a full section in size on the west side of Ashishlapa was added to the Ashishlapa Wilderness through the Dingle Act. So that, that wilderness study area was converted to wilderness and, and increased in size. Um, and I guess in terms of the visual resources in the wilderness, uh, the RMPA is actually not dealing directly with visual resources uh, as the BLM addresses visual resource management. I think, um, you know, those of us that deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis know the different aspects of visual resource management. The, the RMPA is dealing with visual impacts to cultural sites. And um, that's something that maybe, you know, Jeff was just talking about. But um, in terms of visual resource management, the BLM did a resource management plan amendment in 2014 that um, designated visual resource classification areas for the field office. And visual resource management classification one is what our wilderness areas are. And so they have the highest protection of, of any area that the BLM manages. So. Um, I'm happy to address your question further if that doesn't really get at what you were getting to. Um, Great, thanks so much. Uh, Sheree would also like to provide some input on this conversation. Sheree? Hi guys, I'll reintroduce myself, I'm sure. <laughs> You guys are probably tired of hearing from me, but um, again, Sheree from Santa Fe, New Mexico, air resources, climate, greenhouse gases, and climate change. And I did, I, I'm still not um, real solid on what your question is, Mario, but maybe if I provide some responses, um, it'll help or you can give another question. I do want to say that um, the class one and class two areas for, as it relates to air quality or air quality related values. And those air quality related values that for my resource area that I primarily look at includes nitrogen and sulfur deposition and we're concerned about visibility, visibility as well. Um, as you know, um, the visibility is impacted by particulates in the air and different chemical compositions that go on with pollutants. So we definitely are concerned about that. 
Um, table three, four displays the class one areas and the planning areas. And there's a lot of misconception as far as it relates to air quality and visual resources for air quality purposes. The Chaco Canyon National Historic Park is considered a sensitive class two area. And it looks like you're looking at that right now. Um, we BLM does consider that. And we actually, the BLM um, supports a monitoring site there. I was just up there last year. I usually go to visit at least once or twice a year. We do have an air monitoring station there that um, the BLM you know, financially supports. And uh, we monitor conditions up there related to, of course, the standard things that you see at that type of monitoring site, which would be temperature, relative humidity. Um, we would look at um, particulates. It's a lot of different things that we measure at that measuring site at Chaco Canyon. Um, Mesa Verde is the nearest class one area though. And that one is about, as you know, 11 miles north of our planning area. Um, and the Aztec Ruins National Monument is also within our planning area. So we're, we're always looking at those um, important resource areas that are sensitive to air pollution. Um, what else can I say about that? Um, the tribal members do have a process in which if they want to declare an area upgraded from class two to class one, they can, um, they can go to the EPA and request that that area be upgraded. So that's something to consider. I know you mentioned um, Senator Udall about the request that he put forth. Um, so do consider that you do, as a tribal members, you definitely have like certain areas that can be upgraded to class one area, class one area under air quality. So there is a process that you would have to solicit the EPA with. Thanks, Sheree. Um, this is Sarah. And just one more tidbit to add to this, um, all this great conversation is that the VRM classification uh, was, that effort was another amendment uh, to the RMP and that was completed in 2014. So that, that is a separate effort there. So I will go back to Jill after all that great discussion. Great, thanks everyone. So we do have, um, another person with their hand raised will go to, and then I'm going to increase and participants that's joined us. So participants, as soon as this next person speaks, I'll go ahead and give you a quick overview as to why we're here today and how you can join in on our discussion. Um, but first, we'll go ahead and go to Brandon. I am opening your microphone. Let's do a sound check and we'll get your question. Hey, Joe. Um, I'm not sure if Mario might have had something as a follow-up or if there was a clarification. So I don't want to intercede if somebody else needs to, uh, to ask something or get or discuss something. Otherwise, I was just going to clarify some of the previous questions. Okay. Uh, if, if you'd like to go ahead and clarify, since we have your microphone open, let's do that, and then we can move on and um, introduce what we're doing today to the additional attendees that have joined. Okay. I'll try to make it. All right, uh, the, the first one was, uh, my apologies, Dr. Curley, I wasn't able to uh, respond to you, but I was able to hear your response um, to give a little bit more of a nuance and maybe more in depth because this also involves the uh, cultural resources as well. The big concern was not just variation of species, but the genetic variation even at the subspecies level. Um, we have concern that even bringing in same subspecies wood stock, uh, seed stock from another part of the country or another area uh, can impact the genetic makeup of those species within uh, the areas of concern. Uh, additionally, some of the stuff that was being brought up for dust mitigation and invasive species control was bringing in other maybe similar species which can fill certain niches. Um, uh, that also is equally concerning too to the Ojo and Sino chapter. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with uh, cultural, cultural reasons. Um, as you know, it, it's been a while since I've taken botany and genetics, but I do remember that plants are pretty crazy when it comes to uh, adapting genetic material. And uh, so they can somehow bring it in uh, to their 
within their makeup. And as a result, we're very concerned about what species and what seed stock is being brought in and what genetic modification is occurring. Additionally, even at the community level, we're incredibly concerned with any plants being brought in, uh, which then interact at the community level of plants, which will then change the makeup of those plant communities. I know even for myself at a very superficial level, I have seen changes in these communities in counselor. However, people who are much more educated on this, i.e. Navajo herbalists and others who this is their field, have noted these changes occurring within counselor area, particularly since uh, the introduction of a lot of this oil and gas at a large scale uh, there. Uh, interestingly enough, I know I have chatted with folks that have done work on some native species of plants and the compounds that those plants produce. And those compounds that the plants produce, if we're gonna go from more of a physicalist uh, um, point of view, can be modified and changed. I guess it would be the epigenetics of the plant itself based on the communities that the plants are embedded in. These roots are constantly in communication with each other, which then can also modify the animal communities and then once again, referring back to fundamental law, fundamental natural law of Navajo Nation, this is problematic. So um, I'm curious how uh, to clarify that previous question on plant genetics, even at a subspecies level, and then the introduction of niche plants to fill in niches within the community. Uh, this is a complex thing that even ecologists I know for certain are having a tough time grappling with. So I'm not quite sure how the BLM and BIA are properly grappling with this issue to ensure that we're not having major cultural impacts, uh, which can have health impacts as well, because some of the, a lot of this stuff gets used for medicinal purposes for communities, let alone other purposes which are culturally related. That's the first one. That then becomes related back to the consistency review, which looking at um, title at um, CFR 43, of subsection 1610.3-2, part E, it says prior to approval of a proposed resource management plan or amendment to a management framework plan or resource management plan, the state director shall submit to the governor of the state or states involved uh, the proposed plan or amendment and shall identify any known inconsistencies with state or local plans, policies, or programs. And then it goes on from there with the 60-day review period. Here's the issue. Coming back to all the legalities of the Eastern Agency, for example, Ojo Encino chapter has a local level land use plan. As part of the local level land use plan, it is stated that the under, let's see, part two, section E, I dot A, the chapter considers all lands within its boundaries of social, economic, and cultural significance to the community. The chapter also considers these lands to have effects on the political go slash governance integrity of the chapter and the economic security of chapter residents and have effects on the health and welfare of chapter residents. So by the Navajo Nation president not having a consistency review for all lands within Eastern Agency based on the Indian Land Consolidation Act and the Navajo Land Consolidation Act and the territorial jurisdiction as defined by Navajo Nation. How are our plans being ratified correctly to ensure consistency with your plans that you are now putting forward within the Eastern Agency contiguous boundaries? Because that's not occurring at the moment underneath this current setup. The only thing it's considering is strictly state, is strictly federal uh, tribal trust and allotment. And that of course is beyond, uh, of course these plans, local level plans include everything for us. And that comes back again to the plants and those resources and the cultural impacts that are on those communities that live in the area. And then finally, uh, just as a follow up to Sheree, um, I appreciate the, the reply with the, with, the, um, with the EPA standards. I guess where my question was coming at from something where maybe you guys can tackle the PM standards is in the environmental justice section, even though you can't change the standard, of course, but considering those disproportionate impacts upon EJ communities, how can you potentially be able to tackle that issue since there is no safe threshold for PM 
And on top of that, it's disproportionate impact on communities such as that in Counselor and surrounding areas. So thank you. Great, thanks for following up, Brandon. I'm going to go ahead and see if Dr. Curley is available to respond to uh, your more focused comment that you provided. Dr. Curley, are you available? Yes, uh, if you, I, I, can you hear me? Uh, we can, can, thank you. Okay. To respond to your question, I think that was a very um, excellent question. And um, again, uh, when we're looking at reseeding an area, uh, or deranged management specialist and any specialist that's on the ground will usually utilize what's been approved by NRCS for that particular area as far as ecological site description. So that our guide in, in purchasing seeds, the type of uh, seeds for the area as far as uh, native seeds. And, you know, that's, that's basically how the BIA works if, if there's if an area is going to be reclaimed, that's basically uh, our process. Like for example, right now we're working closely with the Navajo Gallup Waterline Project, and <clears throat> there's a reclamation plan that has been developed, and and we have had a chance to review those uh, the, the the plans, and we're looking at uh, the type of seeds they're using, making sure that it's native seed. So, so that's how we work with uh, with uh, with this particular project and i'm pretty sure this will be the same with uh, with this project and i'm sure that there's other um policies and procedures that are in place with blm so thank you very much that will be my response thank you dr curley and um we're going to have rick jump okay, in and follow up on okay. uh, the consistency review question. And Brandon, just to let you know, when we do that consistency review, um, we will be doing our consistency review once we have developed a preliminary final environmental impact statement. That'll be a 60 day consistency review with the BLM and the New Mexico state governor. And then the BIA will be doing a 60 day consistency review with the Navajo nation. And Rick, would you like to follow up a little bit more on how the consist consistency review will happen with other local or tribal official land use planning documents? Sure. Um, it, it, it's a really interesting situation when trying to incorporate all of the uh, local land use um, plans into a bigger plan. And it, this is something that is not limited to just this RMPA. Uh, for example, when I was in Oklahoma, we had to take into consideration every county's plan as we adapted that plan to fit for three different states, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. So it's, it is a something that can be overwhelming at times, but we do do our best to try and include those things that we can. Um, the Navajo Nation and several of the um, chapters are cooperating agencies and thus have had input as we have gone forward with this and uh, we'll have um, a little more in input as we go along and have the, uh, the final draft. When possible, we try to incorporate the aspects of the uh, local plans uh, unless there is a conflict either with a, um, a, a federal law, regulation, or policy, or one within BLM. Um, sometimes uh, we won't specifically address something that is in a local one because it might be very specific and we've already covered it at a higher level. Um, just to make one up, if there were something on protecting, uh, let's say, a, a bird that was culturally important, uh, we have our protections for birds at the the highest level that'll have things like uh, seasonal use or protecting habitat. So we would not go back and readdress it individually as you would with your local plan. Uh, one thing we also have to do is the New Mexico uh, Bureau of Land Management has statewide consistency reviews for their plans. And sometimes when we go through that, 
we have to change what's in our plan so we have consistency across the state. And that is so for the general public, um, operators and others, uh, they don't have a dizzying array of rules across the state to try and comprehend and operate in. Uh, you can imagine the difficulties uh, for our company if we had one set of rules that were drastically different than say Rio Porco, even though we border them. So they do a statewide consistency re review to make sure that the general themes and uh, prescriptions that are in the planning document um, match across the state as much as possible on a, a broad scale. Uh, so that's kind of how we sit, but you know, th I just wanna reiterate that Navajo Nation and the chapters have had input in the crafting of this document and they will have uh, more say um, with the comments they submit for this, where we are able to look at that input and see where we can add it or change things that need to be adjusted within the RMPA. And that's for the BLM. So thank you, Brandon. All right. Thanks, Brandon. And again, we really look forward to seeing a lot of the information you provided to us today submitted as a formal comment. I have been notified that we do have some Navajo Nation Council delegates that have recently joined us. I would like to let you know what we're doing today. Thank you for joining us. We are doing a virtual open house for the Farmington Mancus Gallup Resource Management Plan Amendment and Environmental Impact Statement. Our goal today is to respond to any questions that you or the community may have about the process or the project. And with us being able to respond to those questions, we are hoping that you will be able to provide us some formal comments uh, via the means that are listed on our screen. If you are joining by phone, I will go over how we um, get towards the end of this session. If you would like to provide us a question, we ask that you press star nine on your telephone. When you press star nine, that lets us know that you're available and ready to provide a question to us. I have been told that Council Delegate Nez would like to uh, provide us with a question. And Council Delegate Nez, I believe that you called in, so I do not see um, your name to unmute your phone. So if you could press star nine, and that'll let me know you're ready, and I can open up your microphone. I'm not seeing any of the phone numbers that have joined us uh, raising their hand. So I'll give you another few moments to do that. And again, you raise your hand by pressing star nine. This will alert me that um, you are interested in providing a comment. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I am opening up the phone line to the caller with the last four digits of your phone number as 1620. Let's do a quick microphone check. And you may have to press star six on your end to unmute your microphone. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Delegate Mark Freeland, um, a member of the 24th Nile Nation Council. I'm not. Uh, I'm not Chairman Ricky Nez of Resource and Development Committee, but I am a member of the uh, 24th Navajo Nation Council as well as the Resource and Development Committee, um, the Eastern Agency representative uh, overseeing our chapters out there in Eastern Navajo. I, first of all, I want to um, thank the uh, uh, BLM, the BI, for having this uh, discussion here. Um, today I'm in Winter Rock and I'm here with the Office of the Speaker and we're just listening in today. Um, I really wanted to know um, of course, you mentioned this being an open house, but you know uh, there was a letter sent by Honorable Daniel So um, to the BLM uh, requesting indefinite suspension of these 
uh, consultation, but I want to know if there's going to be a consultation that's going to occur directly with Navajo leadership. And I ask this question because as a member of Resource and Development Committee, uh, the council, we have the uh, obligation to oversee Navajo programs that work directly with you all. Uh, Navajo Minerals is not on this call. Navajo Historic Preservation is not on this call. Navajo Fish and Wildlife is not on this call. I know the consulta consultation letters go directly to the president's office, but you know it's real important that as leadership and as, as community members, as leadership, you know we get informed as well. Um, I represent eight chapters. I represent Crown Point, Nahajishkish, Te Ahe, Vicente, White Rock, Lake Valley, and Naiza. And I have uh, a lot of Alatis out there. And you know, for me, it's real important that I communicate information to them as well. And that's the other question is, you know, um, with Navajo leadership, does this also go down to the local level? I know the gentleman that I mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, the partnership or the partners, um, you know, the chapters need to also be informed as well. Uh, the lo local, the local uh, people, as well as, did you also talk to the Alatis and what's their perspective of this? So it needs to be a full circle process as far as um, in information and sharing information. What we need to do is ensure that, you know, especially our historic preservation, historic preservation be on this call as well. And I, I say this because Navajo's cultural perspective needs to be taken into consideration. Um, it's not just other tribes. We also have, we also have tradition and cultural relevance out there. There are stories, there are sacred sites that we hold dear as well have those considerations been made as well. Um, I think it's real important as a Navajo person, we, we think about those things. So we really need to give that some really some, some consideration. Um, you know, um, for myself and for my colleagues, um, we'd like to have a, if we can, uh, a, a more thorough discussion with you as, as the BLM and, and of course the BIA. The BIA has been very fortunate to work with us, but you know, more thorough discussion on this whole process because, you know, it's important to educate my colleagues and, and the council as well because we are the governing body of the Navajo Nation. And for me, it's important that I share information that's relevant to our people. And it's a, it's a, it's a way of being transparent and open and keeping those channels of communication uh, re uh, relevancy is so important. Um, I have to update everyone. Uh, whether I'm for an issue or not, I still have to talk to my our people out there regardless. And, you know, um, for me, that's vital. And, you know, um, I just wanted to bring that up because the the issue or the, the, the way a consultation should be conducted is with leadership as well. And you include everyone in this whole process. Um, it's not just a check mark. It's not just a... a a way to say, oh, we did that or it was done, but um, we we need to have more thorough discussions with leadership as well and look at it from a top to a local level uh, discussion. Um, you know, we have a lot of input. We have a lot to say. We have we have comments as well, and you know, I, I really want to urge the BLM to all really consider Navajo's cultural uh, relevancy and perspective as well that's a real important factor and there's a lot of sacred sites that we have out there too it's not just other tribes but navajo does have those perspective that perspective that we need to that needs to be considered so i want to say thank you um I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and 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 the opportunity to give some input on this whole discussion so i look forward to uh further discussion with the blm and, and the navajo nation council thank you Great, thank you, Mr. Freeman. I would like to first turn this over to BIA Navajo Regional Director, Bart Stevens. Bart, are you on? Thank you. It, it's Freeland, Bart. Thank you, Delegate Freeland. Um, I just wanted to respond to a few, okay, few of your comments. Yes, we, we did do exactly what you described had a government-to-government -government meeting with President Naz's office. And, and we also, because it's G to G, we forward all documentation that come from BLM and BIA to that office. And, and, 
and what we've done since then is rolled it out to other council delegates because um, we we at the BIA believe that everyone needs to be informed of these meetings going forward with with dates and times and how to get on and how to be a part of the conversation. Um, another piece that I just want to reference is you're absolutely correct. Those the Navajo Nation needs to be engaged and they have been. Um, Navajo Nation HPD is on the call. They've been on a lot of the calls that we've been having with BLM. I'd say almost all of the calls we've had. Um, Navajo Nation Fish and Wildlife and Forestry are also on the call and have been on a lot of the calls going forward. So, and then of course, Robert Begay um, with the BIA um, works very closely with all three, most importantly, the HPD with the Navajo Nation and, and they are in constant dialogue. Um, so they're well represented. We hear from them frequently. Um, and like I said, they, they engage and share information, ask questions, bring things forward. Um, so that, that part is happening. I think that as far as my office is concerned, I think that we could do a better job. Um, although we do a pretty good job as it is, I'm, but we can always improve um, in communication. We can always um, copy um, council delegates or, or division directors or who we need to, and we have to some extent, especially you and others that represent those chapters in that area, um, as well as the, the tri-chapter area being engaged in this process for years as, as um, a cooperator to the efforts of BLM. So that's been an ongoing dialogue as well and they're, they're represented, they engage, they ask questions, and so forth. So a lot of this is, is going forward as you described. Um, and like I said, if we need to reach out more, if we need to include others, then by all means, um, we can do that. Um, another thing that, that was mentioned earlier by BLM on this call was that this isn't a consultation in terms of, of a meaningful uh, requirement. This is information sharing at this point. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's being recorded, Doc, uh, questions are being asked, asked and answered. There have also been requests to put those thoughts and concerns and issues that come from, from the two uh, individuals on the call that are asking the most questions, um, Brandon and, and Mario, to, to put those in writing so they become part of the official record and part of the comments. BLM can answer the more details of what they do with that information going forward. But I want to just thank you for joining the call um, and, and just being heard and, and definitely demonstrate your commitment to, to being engaged and being a part of this activity and wanting to understand and wanting to know more, which, which, uh, which I honor. So with that, I'll turn it over to BLM for whatever details they want to provide, um, what may, I may not have covered. Thanks again. Joe, um, just to follow up to Director Stevens. Um, yeah, thanks to Natani, um, Mr. Freeland. Just um, some specific numbers, uh, just to uh, follow up to Mr. Stevens. We had 11 government to government meetings with the Navajo Nation. We also, in addition to the government to government meetings, we also had 20 section 106 meetings with the Navajo Nation um, to address some of the cultural issues that you have brought up. Again, thank you for the questions, Shinnat Thank you. Al, you're muted. if we can get you unmuted here. Bear with us one second. Uh, hello, uh, Delegate Freely. I, I thank you, uh, Director Stevens and uh, uh, Mr. Begay for that follow-up. I guess, I guess I bring this up because the nation as a whole, um, you know, the nation is the biggest Alati and through the land, uh, land buyback program. And I always want to uh, ensure that the nation's interests are always protected and consideration is given uh, because of that, um, there's a th there's thousands and thousands of Alatis, yes, but 
you know, the nation has the, the biggest, a lot, or has the hugest uh, interest or uh, consumption, or not consumption, but a uh, 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 largest uh, quality of, of allotments out there. And we want to make sure that, you know, um, the mention of consultation uh, has occurred, but you know, as a member of RDC, as a member of Eastern Navajo Agency, as a member of eight chapters out there, you know, we have not, I haven't heard really too much about um, what's been going on and, and the process. And, you know, it's, it's hearing it through uh, secondhand information being passed on or, you know, as RDC, um, we should be involved as well as Resource and Development Committee. Um, you know, the I, I don't want to you know, say that the president's office doesn't share adequate information when notification is given, but we don't get that information. And that information should be shared as, as a member of RDC with us as well. And I, I just bring this up because the land department should be included in these discussions as well, uh, Mr. Halona. And I'm glad, um, I'm glad there's some programs on the line of forestry or fish and wildlife and historic preservation, but all of the, I, the minerals department's not here, or who else is not here? You know, we need, we need to have all the, everyone involved. And, you know, for us as RDC, we can have comments submitted for sure. That's not a problem. But we want to make sure that our participation is considered, our participation is heard, our, our comments are, are made. Um, you know, and I, I really want to really emphasize um, our perspective of, of cultural relevance and, and cultural uh, sensitivity as well, because you know Navajo has, has a lot out there, a lot, and I, I'm really going to advocate for that. I'm going to continue to advocate for that. Our historic preservation program needs to be heard, and you know for me that's real important. That's real vital. Going out there and talking to the people directly north of Chaco that live out there with no running water, electricity. You know, I hear their stories. I've been out there. I've talked to them directly. And, you know, um, the Alatis as well, but also the local level people. Um, I think there's got to be some consideration for that uh, from the, our perspective. So I just wanted to say that. And um, it's Delegate Freeland. Uh, thank you. I, I wish I had a man on my end of my name, but it's Delegate Freeland. So I just wanted to make that correction. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Freeland, and I apologize for misstating your name. Um, Rick Fields, could you weigh in a little bit on what Delegate Freeland has mentioned this afternoon? Yes, I'd be happy to. And uh, it's nice to speak with you again, Delegate Freeland. I know you've been involved with this uh, project for a number of years as we've attended meetings together. Um, We are always open to speaking to the Navajo Nations Council and um, its, its various subcommittees. We, we, we just don't turn down invitations and we're happy to do it. And, and yes, you're correct. The uh, official consultation goes through the president's office, but that does not mean that we will not speak to others. Um, we've given many presentations uh, at various chapters to keep them involved in this process process and we would be more than happy to come and give a presentation and have an interchange uh, with the members of the, the Navajo Council. Um, I noticed you used the phrase not other just other tribes and I know why you're using that and I will say that although we are um, involving uh, various Pueblos and tribes to get their feedback because of the shared cultural um, heritage um, the lands within this planning document if they are not um, managed by the BLM are Navajo Nation lands and we recognize that. Uh, and we do try and get the um, Navajo uh, perspective. Uh, a, a large number of our employees that, that have been involved in this project are uh, Navajo citizens. And they are very uh, happy and very quick to, to point out the, the times when we might have been talking about something that was outside the Navajo perspective, so we can incorporate that. We also work very closely with BIA since we're partners in this. And again, the Bureau of Indian Affairs employees are are very good at giving us the Navajo perspective, as are those that work with the um, FEMO office. And, and so we have tried our best to incorporate that into the document, um, especially on the areas where we talk about um, sacred sites and cultural sites and coming up with the best way to manage those as, as we still um, fulfill our multiple use um, mandate that we have for our agencies. 
I just need to reiterate that this is not consultation and, and it, it's informational and we are happy to to do meetings um, with the, the council and if you can't do them in person at the time, we're happy to try and do them virtually also. Um, it has been a number of years since we just would check the box on consultation. We are rightly so I think proud of the efforts we have made um, especially during this project to consult with tribes, chapters, and, and the interested parties so we can get the uh, vibrant document that needs to come out of this process going forth. Um, there's a lot of um, things in this document that are based upon the input we've had from Navajo citizens and from Navajo leaders um, going um, forward. And, and as mentioned earlier um, by Mr. Begay, you know, we've had a lot of the, the meetings with um, the government to government ones, uh, 11 of those, and then the 20, 106 meetings, uh, and we're going to be having more of those. But, you know, what we didn't mention, and I, it would take me a while to look up, so I'll try and give you a number, but the the number of uh, briefings and meetings we've done with the various chapter houses, and not just the uh, tri chapters, but we've uh, been involved in others. Our uh, tribal liaison, uh, Lola Hino, has done a great job of reaching out, getting out in the community, uh, attending the chapter meetings, and um, getting their feedback and giving it to us. So, um, I, again, if you want to talk, just uh, send us uh, a, a note through uh, one of the various things or, or call us direct. Uh, my email's rafields at blm.gov and, and we'll be happy to set something up. And hopefully uh, with things improving on the COVID front, we'll be able to do these things face-to-face -face in the near future. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rick. And Rick does speak a little quick sometimes. I'm just going to reiterate what his email address is. And it is R A Fields, that's spelled F I E L D S, at blm.gov. And Superintendent Sosi, did you also want to jump in on this conversation? Yes, I do. Uh, good afternoon, Delegate Freeland. Thank you very much for calling in. We, we really appreciate Navajo leadership and your leadership in providing comments and concerns regarding the, the whole RMPA work that we're doing. As you know, I, I've been um, in your updates with the Navajo chapters, I've been providing announcement about the different events related to RMPA, including the and now the VOH that we're doing for the next uh, four days. It is certainly true that uh, Navajo Nation did get significant ownership on a lot of lands in Eastern Navajo Agency. But I'm not sure about the number on those allotments within the oil and gas development. But nonetheless, um, if you look at the last um, land buyback uh, purchase event that happened, um, there are 869 allotments that now have um, 50% or more Navajo Nation ownership in those allotments in the Eastern Navajo Agency. Um, there are, there's a total of 4,531 allotments where Navajo Nation has some ownership on the allotments. So I wanted to share that data um, that um, certainly looking at the Navajo leadership, um, Navajo Nation President's Office in providing comments um, to this process is very, very important. So we really appreciate you coming on today as well as other RDC and other delegates that, that provide feedback, recommendations and comments on this process. I wanted to just mention on two other events that we held back in, I believe it was in October 2019. Uh, we had a uh, RDC public hearing at NIEZI. Um, the, the main agenda was to listen to Alati, their comments for oil and gas development and RMPA work that we're doing. And certainly there, there were a lot of really good feedback discussions that happened there. Um, although it wasn't necessarily on record because it was sponsored by the Navajo Nation, uh, that public hearing, um, BIA was present, BLM was also present, listening to the concerns that were being raised by Alati. 
much of the conversation was about securing the opportunity for Latis to benefit from the oil and gas situation. Another uh, significant uh, feedback that we got there was that there were some uh, Navajo medicine men that also provided a really extraordinary comment on Navajo spiritual life and how um, Navajo spirituality should need to be respected, all the sacred places that are there. So that was a really um, enlightening and listening session that we were part of. So certainly engaging Navajo leadership, Navajo tribal members is really critical as we continue to move forward. And so some of the comments that, that will be coming forthcoming will again be integrated into the plan. So uh, we appreciate Navajo leadership being here. So I just wanted to add that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. And thank you to the RDC for joining us today. We do have someone that has their hand raised that would like to provide us a question. Yolanda, I am going to open up your microphone. Let's do a sound check. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, Yolanda, we do. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Yolanda Hernandez and I'm from um, the Nyese Lightbrook area. Um, the question I want to ask is, as an allottee, is there a process as landowners in which we are able to move land out from being held in trust to individual independent ownership in which we are able to make sound decisions for the lands that we own? Thanks for that question, Yolanda. I'm going to send this over to Maureen with the Federal Indian Minerals Office. Maureen. Good afternoon. Thank you, Yolanda, for that question. So if, if you're referring to an allotment, if you have 100% interest in that allotment, you can um, do one of two things. You can move to sell that and by regulations and policy, the first um, entity that you have to propose that sale to is to the Navajo Nation. Your second option is to do a, a trade or the Navajo Nation. Now, if your interest, if, if in that allotment, if you have a small interest or there's other individuals that have interest with you, then that would be a little bit more complicated because you have to, um, in, you know, not by the designation of acreage in that allotted land. And so under the, under rules, regulations, and policy, there's a certain percentages that you have to meet and agree upon as a group to be able to do the one of two things I had said, sell it to the Navajo Nation or negotiate for uh, land trade does that i hope that answers your question that's really quick and dry um superintendent did you have anything else to add to that oh, the only comment i would add is that at our agency we do have um uh, transaction realty transactions that we've been processing in terms of a lot that's being sold to the navajo nation so that is something that we do do at the agency and certainly it's all voluntary and uh, we have a staff, a really good staff that provides clear guidance and consultation with the Alati who might want to sell the land. So uh, certainly give us a call at BIA Eastern Nava Agency, 505-786-6032. Uh, if you want to look at options on how to manage your allotment, including if you're interested in selling it. Thank you. 
Superintendent, can you confirm that that phone number you gave was 505-786-3802? Is that correct? Incorrect. I'm sorry, I, I just kind of said it real fast. So it's 505-786-6032. Oh, you cut out there uh, with the last four digits. We have 505-786-6032. I really messed that up. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, we have five minutes left and we do still have two, two callers uh, that would like to ask us questions. Uh, so we will have this first caller Caller number eight, go first. And then after caller number eight, we're going to have Mario provide his comments and then we'll wrap up for today. We do wanna let you know that we are offering additional sessions after today. Tomorrow we are having the same format uh, beginning from nine to noon in the morning and then one to three or one to four in the afternoon. And tomorrow's focus group will be for Pueblos and other tribes and then on Friday and Saturday, we are having an open forum where it's not specific for any focus group. Um, so you are welcome to join those. If you need assistance in registering for those or how to register, we'll uh, follow up with that information as we close out today. So let's go to caller number eight uh, with the last four digits, 1620. If I remember right, this was Delegate Freeland previously. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry, you, you. With a piece of chalk. you could come with a piece of chocolate in my mouth, so I apologize. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I appreciate um, uh, Mr. Fields, as well as uh, Director Stevens, and um, of course, uh, Superintendent Sosi. Um, the follow-up, um, we're gonna request a follow-up with um, the BLM and the BIA together. Um, I'm going to request it through my chair, uh, Honorable Ricky Nez, um, to have a, a more thorough discussion with the Resource and Development Committee on this topic. Um, my my uh, colleague, Honorable Daniel So, my, my Honorable, I always call him my Honorable Esteem Che, um, he, he he brought up some very valid points and, and I really want to um, support him and, and support uh, his efforts and his letter that he had um, provided to you all, um, as as you know, I like I said before, I want to ensure that Navajo's perspective is really strongly considered because once this RMPA is put together, you know, I, I want to have a a document that's relevant to Navajo and reflects Navajo's perspective as well. So, um, you know, abiding by the request of uh, Honorable So. Um, asking that these consultations you know um not conclude or not you know if there's an extension that can be made i know that has been requested already but you know i'm going to support that as well and you know i'm going to go back and talk to our chapters and to our our, our people and, and see what their take on it as well so i just wanted to make that to, to talk today and i appreciate the discussions and the efforts that you all are putting forth too so thank you Thank you, Delegate Freeland. So uh, we will definitely, uh, I have a sticky note to follow up with you on getting the BLM and the BIA together to discuss uh, with the Resource Development Committee um, anything going on in this project. So we will be following up with you shortly. And we will move on to our next and our last caller for today. Uh, Mario, I am going to open up your microphone. Um, let's make sure that we can hear you and I'm then here. you can uh, you. Thank, thanks. So um, just released like around one o'clock today is a press release from uh, yeah. Senator Tom Udall's office, August 26, 2020. New Mexico lawmakers urge Interior Department to extend public process for proposed Chaco Canyon drilling plans during pandemic. Despite repeated calls from tribes, local communities to extend and postpone drilling plans until citizens can safely provide input. Interior is moving forward with plans for virtual 
public meetings in areas with little or no broadband access. Washington, U.S. Senators Tom Udall, Martin Heinrich, uh, Assistant Speaker Ben Ray Lujan, Deborah Howland urged the Trump administration to extend the period for public input and delay on-site inspect inspections, draft Farmington Resource Management Plan Amendment, RMPA, which includes potentially opening up more areas around Charcoal Cultural National Historic Park to oil and gas drilling until the COVID-19 crisis can be contained. The lawmakers, in a letter to the U.S. Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt, are requesting that the Bureau of Land Management reconsider its plans to move forward with the virtual public meetings as Northwest New Mexico communities affected by the process often lack adequate broadband and are being hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. As the, as the lawmakers note, the pandemic conditions that warranted an initial delay in the public process, which Interior Department agreed to in May, still stubbornly remain in place today. Quote, the, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to radically alter the lives of New Mexicans, limiting their ability to fully participate in the public processes, fundamental, but in the public processes, fundamental to the economy and way of life in, in and around the BLM Farmington District in the northwest corner of our state, the lawmakers wrote. Despite these concerns, several public processes proceed apace, hurtling forward to provide additional acreage for an oil and gas industry with seeming little need for it, given the worst price and oversupply conditions in at least a decade. Accordingly, we ask you to indef definitely pause on-site inspections for applications to per applications for permit to drill, APDs, and the larger public process for the RMPA until this deadly virus can be contained. And it goes on, and it's gonna take a while for me to get through that. Personally, it's what I just said in the beginning. We've been saying this before, and it's irksome that it takes US senators for you, for BIA to even start thinking for themselves and really taking the trust responsibility for the communities that are being incredibly impacted and to go on as business as usual is criminal. And I said, it's my job. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Mario, for your comments for today. Um, Bart, would you like to respond? Um, and then maybe we can start closing out for the day as well. Yeah, I can um, summarize, I guess, again, the, the direction that's rolling out from the Department of Interior, um, from the Secretary to BLM and to BIA, for that matter, regarding timelines. Um, it's certainly, you know, we get letters, I don't know if Mario's still on or not, but we get letters, uh, Congress generates letters all the time requesting um, the administration, which includes, as he stated, the president, the department, and all the other cabinets within his administration to to change direction, to, to put out requests, to do a lot of different things. And, uh, and that's where that level of decision making lies is um, from Congress to the administration to the department. And then, of course, the process is whatever decision is made, whatever um, changes are made at that level, then it trickles down to BLM and, and BIA um, through our assistant secretaries down to the field with specific direction. Um, so absolutely, um, you know, we, we know that we're in the middle of this pandemic. We know that communication is, is, um, um, challenging and it's like, and like I started this meeting or somewhere throughout the day. Anyway, I commented about, you know, there are challenges everywhere. We're getting used to this new way of doing, doing business, if you will, sharing information, communicating. Um, you know, many of us are teleworking, um, many of us VPN in and are able to conduct the work that, that we do without interruption. And in, in a lot of instances, it's working better than, than being in the office. I mean, I'll use myself as an example. And I've said this before, I'm 
I feel I'm more productive teleworking than I am in my office because, you know, I do 12 hour days easily. Um, um, then, then if you go in the office and you're there for, for nine and a half hours or so. So, um, I, I respect the letter. I respect the, the communication between Congress and, and the administration. Um, we wait for that to be processed by the administration and then we await whatever changes come about as a result. Um, uh, Jill, I don't know if you want me to include closing comments at this point or just be responsive to uh, Mario's comments. If you'd like to give your closing comments and then Al can give his and I'll just give a quick brief on how okay. they can join additional. I, I just want to thank everyone. You, you know, my opening comments, I, I value um, the role that I play. I, I value um, my work ethic and being responsive to being able to do what's best and being a steward of the government, but also being a Native American, uh, uh, a culturally aware, um, uh, one that is tied to, to my tribes, my communities, my families, my relatives, and all my extended family that are out there in Indian country. And, and answering to our elders and answering, you know, what, what are you doing to, to help? I didn't join the 